Jack. Levi. The Book Club from Hell. Hello everyone, this is Jack with The Book Club from Hell, an anti-natalist think tank advocating for a sharp expansion of the welfare state. This week's episode is on The Population Bomb by Paul R. Ehrlich, a former Stanford researcher in conservation biology. First published in 1968, this book predicted inevitable famines during the 1970s which were to claim hundreds of millions of lives. The cause of these famines? Human population growth. These famines, and a whole host of other problems, would only worsen over time unless radical steps were taken to significantly reduce the human birth rate. While not as philosophically interventionist as someone like Penty Linkler, Ehrlich was certainly passionate. Despite the famines he predicted never eventuating, he claimed in 2009 that the main flaw with the population bomb is that it was too optimistic. If you like what we're doing with this podcast and want to support us, we have a Patreon account, the link to which is in the show notes. We release bonus episodes on Patreon and have weekly chats with subscribers about our most recent episodes. I've also published a novel called Tower if you're interested in hearing more from me. And finally, we have a Discord server for this podcast on which you can find Levi, me and plenty of other degenerates who listen to the book club from hell, the link to which is also in the show notes. So if you want to hear more reasons not to have children, then listen on. Enjoy. <laughs> wow, Jack, you have strong feelings on this one. I've never heard of strong you have, having on. strong strong opinions on any on any topic. I'm I'm quite surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I have strong feelings on most about of the books we cover, except for the ones that like Hitman, which will be Oh no, Hitman will have released by the time this one releases. Ones like Hitman are just completely frivolous, so I don't really have any strong feelings on them. <laughs> Things like this I do. We were talking about the hook for this episode and decided to start recording it. The hook, at least at the moment, is overpopulation is always going to destroy the world. Because it, It's always, it's always it, a decade away. Yeah, yeah. This book is the pessimistic version of nuclear fusion is five years in the future, but nuclear fusion is always five years in the future. Yeah. Well, AGI <laughs> is always five years in the future. And in this, it's everything is going to be fucked and everyone's going to starve in... Uh, this was written in 68, and he said during the 70s. So between two and 12 years in the future, everything is fucked and we're all going to starve. Yeah, is, so he predicted... Basically uh, this book. He predicted that hundreds of millions of people would starve uh, in the 70s and 80s. and He was a bit... No, nah, I'm pretty sure he said billions. Billions. He was okay, kind yeah. of hazy with his numbers. <laughs> he did drift... Between orders of magnitude, but he was he was hazy enough that normally that level of haziness would give you some wiggle room to get out of being wrong about your prediction. But he was so wrong that even being off by an order of magnitude, <laughs> he was he was so wrong, wrong and <laughs> won't walk it back. <laughs> and won't walk so it he back. was <laughs> I, he was asked in the early two thousands, like in the yeah the early two thousands, about his predictions made in this book, and. He kind of wriggled out of the question while also being self-aggrandizing. He said something to the effect of, oh, well, I wasn't pessimistic enough. That was my no. problem. No, no. When the interviewer asked, well, Paul, hundreds of millions slash billions of people didn't starve to death over the 1970s and 1980s. And he just... I, 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 I wish I had that sort of confidence where... I could I could have something that I'd categorically stated thrown back to me and said, "Well, no, you're just demonstrably wrong," and turn it around and basically say, "No, I was super smart, and the only thing that I did wrong was not be I didn't demonstrate quite how smart I was." <laughs> so for much of this episode, we agreed in advance that we're going to try to be really generous and view his arguments from the perspective of someone in 1968 without the benefit of being able to look back on the 70s and 80s and say, well, actually, no, global famine and wars, like, global wars over food didn't happen. Yeah, because I suppose... Which, which, which uh, is one of his predictions here. The benefit of Heinz... I, there are some caveats to what I'm about to say, which we'll get into in the episode, but... No the caveats. Benefit, uh, the benefit of, of hindsight, 50 years now... Uh, is that uh, we can state empirically that he was wrong. Mm. <laughs> and uh, whereas 
the question would be, I suppose, uh, could somebody have stated with so much confidence that he was wrong uh, at the time of publication? I'm going to suggest that they could have, uh, but um, I guess that, that's that's for, for later in this, the discussion. But it's a good question to ask because there's contemporaries now in, in 2024, in the 2020s, and, and definitely uh, in the late 20 teens, who were making very similar uh, arguments. And I think people continue to say the same stuff until um, hopefully some of the ideas that we discussed diffuse out into the culture uh, about like, okay, these arguments have been wrong since like 1776 or whenever Mouth has published his work and they're still yeah. wrong in 1968 and they're still wrong in 2024 and they'll be wrong in a hundred years. <laughs> yeah. And uh, 1798. 17, was 17 when he so it's like these ideas have been wrong for a really long time and they're going to continue to be wrong and uh and they kind of shape shift into like they adopt the new you know like in the early 2000s it was al gore with peak oil in the 2010s it was like xr in you know whatever like the 70s it was like <clears throat> it was probably like the like after the oil crisis Insufficient and food stuff production was what food production like was talking about and in the and in england and stuff um, when Malthus was writing, it was also food production. But um, mm. yeah, they sort of, it morphs and adapts, but there's the reason why it's the same class of argument and we'll get to the discussion about that in a bit, like is largely to do with like the relationship between like what humans are doing that is different to what other animals are doing with regards to like the way that we interact with our environment. And yeah. yeah. This is not, this is not perfectly explanatory, but I do think a, Part of it, it's it's of the same class of of concern as as for example, people who in every age say that culture is now dead. the the, the good culture was in the past. Our culture is now degraded yeah. and empty, and the we're spiritually yeah. bereft and barren. Which people are certainly saying now, but then when you look back to times when people now are saying, "Oh, well, that was a great spiritual age," people are also we're also saying that it's a thing, time yeah. of decay and dissolution. <laughs> and I think in large part, those the feelings that we're living in a uniquely terrible time or a time of unique decay is that any, any human endeavour, any endeavour subject to time is subject to change. And by virtue of the fact of living now, we don't know how the story ends. That We, mm. we don't know that... We don't know what is it is going to be like in fifty years, mm. and that sense of vulnerability and of of a lack of knowledge of the future, I think, is responsible for a lot of this catastrophization. Not only around, say, ecological questions in the context of the population bomb, mm. but more generally. Yeah, there's also an interesting idea around like the uh, what would you call it the um, like secular eschatology, you know. Like there's a, mm, mm, there's always mm. been um, mythological traditions uh, that have proposed that the end is nigh. We're living in the uh, Kali Yuga, the end of the world. You know, like Jesus has been coming back for oh, the last yeah. 2000 years. You know, Muhammad's supposed to be or like whatever the Islamic equivalent is like. And then, you know, even Zora as, as the top of the sales funnel. The yeah. world is about to end is really good. Is a really like, good I, one. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to adapt that to trying to sell people on buying tower. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I haven't quite worked out how to convince people that buying tower is in some way going to save them from the end of the world, but I am, yeah. I am working on it. Don't <laughs> worry. Yeah. We were looking, my partner and I shout, shout out to my significant other. <laughs> I don't know how she puts up with me. <laughs> um, uh, uh, we were talking about like adopting a, uh, a religion and, uh, she her her grandfather was Russian Orthodox, and uh, which is a pretty funky fun, funky form of like Catholicism. Uh, and of all the ones that I'd get into, oh, I'd, don't I'd probably, call them Catholic. It's okay, yeah, okay. Catholics no, they probably, and, and sorry. Eastern Orthodox people yeah. would fucking probably flip out if you said that. I'm sorry, <laughs> I don't know the differences between between the different denominations of this thing. <laughs> those yeah, differences in the conception of the Trinity between those two; those are fighting words. <laughs> I apologize to my significant other's dead grandfather. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, and that's cool, like funky form of 
Christianity is cool, but I was also thinking like, and we started looking into Zoroastrianism, like that's even funkier. Fuck like yeah, fire <laughs> cults. Yeah, but it turns out they also have like a uh, an es- es- like an apocalyptic eschatological uh, mythology, and it's been around. This 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 thing has been around for ages, and then when you look at like Marxism or environmentalism, it's the same thing. It's like people think the world is ending, and maybe it's not like maybe the world's actually just not ending and there's nothing particularly special about your time being alive in terms of the end of the world maybe what's special about right now in human civilization is we live in the one period of history where things are like getting better (laughs) you know (laughs) yeah in terms of that eschatology because i think i might be totally wrong there might actually be something there there might be a coming end that is just there might be hard-coded but a lot of it strikes me as it, it is the observation that, like I said before, anything subject to time is subject to decay. And we, we live in this constant process of dissolution and reformation, particularly because we live in this very, very weird bit of the universe where most of the universe is subject. So everywhere is subject to entropy. We live in this weird bit of the universe where these small pockets of stable phenomena use that entropy gradient to start forming greater and greater complexity. So we live in this little bit where the ubiquitous decay is used as a motor to form new things, which is, which I think is deeply profound, almost very spooky what's going on on earth. But the, People will observe that constant degradation and say, oh, well, that must, con- that must continue to zero. And I guess eventually there's the heat death of the universe. That mm. no- nothing interesting will be happening if we- mm. it's just a-, a homogenous, completely homogenous mass. But that's a long way away. And in the meantime, I think we do just live in continuous flux and change. Mm. This is not a unique insight. Now, Heraclitus said it mm. a few thousand years before I just did. However, I'm a lot more important. I have a bigger audience. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) At least. (laughs) At least as a podcaster. Uh, Fucking Heraclitus, what does he know? (laughs) Yeah. You know, uh, there is one part of the universe which isn't subject to entropy. Uh, Jack, do you know what what part of the the universe is not? Anyone who signs up to our Patreon account (laughs) is now not subject to entropy. Yeah, that's our yeah. that's our biggest <laughs> promise. You get that at the sixty thousand dollar a month tier. You can you actually step outside entropy. of the second yeah, yeah. law of thermodynamics. <laughs> <laughs> we are we are that good. <laughs> so uh, should we explain a little bit should of we the, talk about the book context of the book and yeah. the background? Uh, who is actually per- Paul expectations Ehrlich going and... into it? Oh yeah, yeah. Before before the context stuff. So my expectations were, what would I say? I wasn't exactly negatively inclined towards Paul Ehrlich or the book, but if you've, I've I've already read the beginning of Infinity, which has a substantial, the most, I, th- I think the most airtight refutation of um, Malthusianism uh, that I that I've ever read. Uh, and I've also read, I'm a big fan of uh, Saifedean Amus, who's a Bitcoin economist guy. And he wrote in his book, The Principles of Economics, like a further, another, uh, an economics based. So like David Deutsch wrote an epistemology based refutation of Ehrlich. Um, Saifedean Amus wrote an economics based uh, refutation of Ehrlich in Principles of Economics, which is the book he published last year, I think. And I also read, uh, the uh, the ultimate resource, which is a, a book by Julian Simon, an economist who uh, Paul Ehrlich had a bet with about um, the predictions about like the prices of commodities in the future, and like that's uh, an economic and also just like a really interesting philosophical refutation of Ehrlich. So I'd already read a bunch of refutations of Ehrlich, mm-hmm. and uh, so I had to go in thinking like, okay, well it'll be interesting to see what he actually wrote and see like the details and 
uh, see if there was anything other than the refutations that I read that were of interest, which I actually did find. There were some things in the book that I thought were interesting to take take into account, and we can talk about those things around environmental degradation. Um, mm. But at least the main part of the book, I kind of had to try to... It's hard not to let that colour my <laughs> thinking, mm. uh, but... Yeah, and 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 sorry. The the other thing I was taking into it was uh, I got really into um, uh, kind of kind of environmentalism, sort of like uh, like about I don't know, like eight years ago or something. Not, not exactly. I don't know. I was just reading up on like a bunch of environmental, and I've read like probably a lot of the like Naomi Klein and um, uh, and you know like uh, limits to growth. Uh, mm. and and those sorts yeah, of books Spring, and like I got really into the thinking yeah th- that like these guys pe- pe- people like Ehrlich and his predecessors uh, so I spent a bit of time occupying this mindset and then it was really like the beginning of infinity that um, basically error cor- like I was able to like error correct that that bad philosophy and uh and it got me out of that like kind of pessimistic environmental thinking uh so i'm somewhat empathetic as well to the people who are into this sort of stuff and the distress they feel so yeah i know that's kind of what i was taking into it um what about you jack slightly different but i think largely in line with with how you felt going into this book i was neutral leaning towards not looking forward to it, but not not in the same way as some of the other stuff we've read that I, that I just really didn't want to read. This was only slightly not wanting to read it. With a bit of interest. So I'd I'd heard, and I, I put it on the list in part because I'd heard that he made a bunch of really, really extreme prescriptions, which he, he does, but not in the same way that a bunch of his detractors claim. Particularly, mm. Mm. I've seen it claimed in a, in several places that Ehrlich proposed to just sterilise everyone in India. No. And that yeah. was part of the reason why I put this book on the list, because I thought, wow, that's a really, really extreme proposed solution to overpopulation, yeah. to just fucking <laughs> sterilise a billion people. He He doesn't say that. Like, he... What he said was, I think there was some... Indian, either a politician or just an Indian thinker who proposed rewarding men in some way, whether with payments or something else, for having a vasectomy after having had after two or three children. Kids. And what yeah. Ehrlich in this book says, yep, great idea. Uh, and that's a... I was disappointed that he said something yeah. that was that's a far, far cry more temperate than what it is. Yeah, yeah <laughs> what, what, what has been ascribed to him. Uh, so I was I was looking forward to the bonkers extreme positions that have been attributed to him which he didn't actually say which was a bit disappointing it, he doesn't mm. go full penty linkler here <laughs> which i would have <laughs> yeah <laughs> which Jack um, would have liked <laughs> yeah otherwise i particularly at university i've been exposed quite a bit to to this sort of very this sort of deep pessimism that does change its mm. its form a bit it, it's expressed in different ways here it was expressed as as mm. pessimism pessimism based on resource depletion secondary to overpopulation it can also be expressed as deep pessimism based on carbon emissions leading to climate change mm. and like you i have a lot of empathy for the distress caused by these sort of problems because they are problems yeah, I, they're where I, problems for sure yeah, where There's i differ no is i'm not i don't agree with that fatalism and deep pessimism no. and yeah and and refusal to acknowledge that there are solutions other than basically like dramatically reducing the number of people or making mm. humans or much stopping poorer progress. or limiting, yeah, like more limiting any of our technological ambitions. development or, or authoritarianism yeah, I think, or anything like that. Yeah. yeah, in part because I, I, I'm just temperamentally optimistic. I think we we're really good at solving problems. Mm. At our solutions to problems 
invariably generate more problems and we're good at solving those too. Mm. So maybe my my reticence going into this book is more a temperamental one in that Ehrlich strikes me as a very pessimistic person and that's that's really not who I am. And yeah. <laughs> there's there's always going to be that fundamental disconnect. I, I occasionally like have conversations with... Uh, I find the, the culture of pessimism to be overwhelmingly dominant it's I, I find it, at least in the circles that i uh i socialize in people are mm, mm. very optimistic uh, very, very pessimistic and how do i put it like it's the prevailing paradigm it feels like uh and yeah and uh maybe i'm wrong maybe, maybe it's just the people i happen to you know like socialize with or whatever um but <clears throat> Uh, the, the culture of pessimism is, is, if I could put it pretty simply, it's basically that there is one or more uh, unsolvable problems uh, and therefore the future is worse than the present. And oftentimes the, uh, you know, the policy or normative or ethical like uh, conjecture based on that insoluble problem in the future uh, is to take some sort of drastic action, like not having children in your personal life, if that's, you know, like you're a younger person or introducing like, uh, you know, advocating for political authoritarianism or that sort of stuff. And, uh, and then I find myself basically having conversations with people <clears throat> where I try not to get too worked up because it's very weird because we're having an argument, like a, not, not, not an argument, but like a debate about, um, mm about my position on optimism and i'm basically taking like a very optim like i'm saying like no like we can solve these problems these i'm acknowledging that the things that you've said are problems like pollution or whatever but we can solve them and the future is better and therefore you shouldn't tell your daughter or you know because often it's older people that i'm having these stuff you know like one case example for example uh, uh recently some friends very pessimistic about the future are like you know like don't have kids it's like what don't like don't like what no okay well that would be fine if what you were saying were true but it's not true like uh over the course of our lives if you're 70 the world's gotten better like <laughs> like there's less death there's more people they're living better lives there's more political freedom like uh the cold war is over there's less deaths from war like there's less deaths from environmental issues like like I could name a million, like we're wealthier, we have more technology, <laughs> you know, like we're more connected than ever. We have access to like the world's information at, the, at our fingertips. And yet you're, you think like somehow the world is getting worse and therefore that I shouldn't have kids or that other young people younger than me, so like whatever, shouldn't be having kids. And so I'm trying to explain to them like this idea of problems are solvable. Yes, the problems that you've noted are very big and important, but we can solve them. And therefore, what young people need to hear is that they have the agency and the capability to, if they put their mind to it, to go and solve these big, important problems. They don't need, like, people shutting them down, telling them how fucked up the world is, and then, like, making them distressed and panicked and then, like, funneling that energy into, like, like political... Uh, anarchy or political authoritarianism and that sort of stuff and it's very odd to be like essentially like the odd person out and the weirdo for essentially advocate not even advocating but explaining that like actually the world isn't as fucked up as you think and you should be a little bit like happier about our situation <laughs> it's really weird it's, it's such as it's a bit of a head fuck to be honest because they think like i'm crazy or something <laughs> yeah I mean, in a similar vein to what i was saying earlier about how the I'm empathetic about the distress people feel yeah. about a lot of these huge problems. Mm. But like with the, the culture of pessimism, I guess, that you're describing where I and you differ from it, mm. is that I, in the face of these problems, it's not even that I don't think people should like get worked up over them. I think it's good to get worked up over them. It's then yeah. what do you do with that energy? And... Yeah, where I get very irritated mm. is when that energy is dedicated towards basically 
stating over and over and over again as some sort of perverse purity ritual that everything is mega <laughs> fucked. We're yeah. sinners. Or you, we're, we're sinners in some <laughs> secular sense. This is like and um, that self flagellation, <laughs> like the, the monks. It's, it's self flagellation <laughs> that leads to this strange stasis because yeah. <laughs> the self flagellants don't tend to do anything to solve the problem. Beyond, <laughs> no, no, it doesn't do anything. Beyond, doesn't beyond crying in public, it definitely makes you and look very like, virtuous on social media, though, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, and that, and that's fine. It's just I don't consider that to be remotely helpful in the face of genuine problems. Like, it's, it's I agree like, that there are problems, so let's let's fix them. Let me let me bitch and moan just about repeatedly saying that there are problems and then not modifying your behavior or not making any effort to solve the problems that you base your personality around decrying. <laughs> so that <laughs> in that you like people will be able to work out my views of the book just from that basically. Yeah. The, the, the we'll, we'll talk about the arguments in the book and I would like to focus more on the good aspects of the book because mm. it would be it'd be easy and in a in the same way that eating a large amount of it, raw glucose is satisfying, it would be satisfying <laughs> for me to just shit on it from that perspective. But it's not, it's not yeah. helpful. <laughs> no, no. Just before we jump into the book, and I might re- come back to this at the end of the, the episode if I remember. But I, I get really, I think it, 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 I get worked up about it, about this cultural pessimism um, when it affects anybody of any age of any group. Um, but I, in, in particular, I get really upset. Uh, when it, when it affects younger people, um, younger people at, at the start of their career, so like in their twenties or their thirties, younger people, especially in high school or primary school, you know, like these kids, uh, in, you know, like they're captive in this like, um, non-consensual education system. And then they're getting like shoveled into their fucking ears. Like the, this like propaganda from like environmentalist crap about like how the world's fucked and like they're so fucked and everything's going to shit. And then it's like, there's no, it's not surprising when you see like kids get so upset about, um, like these, these issues when they've been told that all these problems exist and sure they do exist. Um, but then they're never like, I don't feel like there's any, there's, there's a follow-up to explaining whenever there's a problem or some set of problems, the follow-up should be, but yes, if you find this problem meaningful, you have the capability as a person, a person is a problem solver. You're a problem solver. And if you find this interesting, you can go and study the relevant science or engineering or whatever, and you can maybe make some contribution to this issue. It might be small in your own life, or it could be big. Like there are people who solve people, not generally not individuals, but teams often um, of people who, who solve really big, big, important problems. And young people, I think, are not being told often enough that if they choose to, and they're willing to dedicate like a, a substantial amount of their life and energy and their creativity towards solving these big, important problems um, that they can and that they could if they really want to. And I think like that's without that second half, of um of of uh whether it's education or just the second half of the conversation it's uh i think we're doing young people especially in like a place like australia like the world over but it seems like it's even worse in like continental europe um we're doing a whole generation of of young people like a huge disservice i it's it could only be demoralizing and um making a lot of millions and millions of, of young people feel like um, the the future doesn't have a place for them. And I think it mm. does. And I think they have an active role to play. And it's incumbent upon us, especially, you know, like as, like, as we get older, that um, we're telling people this and then we're telling young people that they... Like, I, for one, when I have kids, which I hope I hope to have kids, uh, will be always like encouraging them to embrace the complexity of of the world um, with an open attitude towards problem solving even if you can't think of a solution right now doesn't mean the thing is not solvable mm. that's so, yeah, yeah. I'd, i'm not really gonna add much to that i i agree with that the the future is 
exciting. I, I, there's no... So it, it doesn't violate the laws of physics to say that the future will be better than today. Like it's, it's possible, it's contingent upon us to make it happen. It's our choice. So let's get yeah. into it. <laughs> let's talk yeah. about somebody who, so, who doesn't believe in human choice and the power of human problem solving. <laughs> let's just get into the yeah. body of the book. <laughs> so the, the argument of within this book is pretty basic, and I imagine we're not going to spend a huge portion of this episode going over his points. So this is very much a, a work of activism. And when I say it's a work of activism, I don't mean that disparagingly. He's fairly open about the fact that this is more a work of activism than mm. it is not a scientific work, for example. When I say activism, I mean it is, it is presenting an argument and it's a call to action. So it's not, it's not assembling data looking at the data and then trying to work out some sort of explanation underpinning these data. It, it, he very much has in mind what is happening, what should be done, and he's convincing you, the reader, um, of, of his contention and telling you what you should do in, in response to that. His contention is basically that in the year 1968, the world is overpopulated people are reproducing at an unsustainable rate, the population is only going to explode. And because, because of the increase in population and the fact that agricultural production is going to remain either the same or increase very slightly in a very, very optimistic future, then you're going to have, through the 70s and 80s, mass starvation. So people are just going to be dying left, right and centre... On the edition I have, on the front, it says something like, it. in the time of reading this, three children will have died of, of starvation. Let me, let me just get the book, actually, because the, yeah. no, the, the front cover of this book sums up a lot of, um, a lot of what's in this book. So in that sense, shout out to whoever designed. Yeah, so <laughs> while you are reading these words, three children are dying of starvation and 24 more babies are being born. There you go. So that's the that's the front cover of the. Um, oh, when was this? I, I I've got the reprint. It, it, it was um a, a, a second edition release in the seventies. Mm. So that that's the front cover. That basically sums up the entire book. So, <laughs> and then for the rest of the book, he he hits you over the head with positive data. I, I guess this gets back to. It's not as bad as an example as. Selective Breeding and the Birth of Philosophy by Costin Alamariu, but it's still very much in that vein where he's just presenting you with positive evidence, so things that support his argument. He never engages with things that might be problematic for his argument. It's very much a polemical work. Mm. So, so the, the bulk of the book is dedicated to presenting you with certain reasons as to why overpopulation is going to destroy everything you love. Mm. So overpopulation is going to lead to mass starvation. That's the biggest point he makes or the, the, what he returns to the most. Mm. Overpopulation is going to lead to environmental degradation. So smog all over mm. every city that is, will just be unbreathable. Mm. It will lead to overcrowding. He He, <laughs> he takes the... Uh, the, the birth rate of uh, some year, let's just say 68, so sometime in the 60s, and then goes 400 years in the future and says, oh, well, if we maintain this birth rate, then the entire surface of the earth is going to be covered with apartment blocks X stories high and you're going to have X <laughs> square metres of space, which it, we'll, get, we'll get to his criticisms of this sort of m monotonic thinking probably later in the episode, where he doesn't really seem to think that people can change their behaviour, that there will be some point over the next few centuries when people might just stop having as many children if they're that mm. crowded. Mm. So there's that. Then there's there's pollution and, and degradation of the environment aside from smog, so poisoning of waterways, the, the degradation of soil, which will lead to reduced agricultural output, all these sorts of things. 
One of my favorite sections is where he proposes, he gives a number of hypothetical future scenarios, mm. which are pretty catastrophic and in kind of funny ways. <laughs> There's a really, really good one where, and, <laughs> and actually, and even this better. So when he's presenting these, <laughs> when he's presenting these, he's presenting them as the future is not going to play out exactly mm. as I say they would, as it, as it will, but. It's, mm. it's going to be similar. It won't be the same, but it might rhyme. Then in the afterward to his second edition published sometime in the 70s, he kind of rewrites history in that he says, oh, well, these, these, are, these were meant to be thought pieces just to make you think about what the future might be. These weren't meant to be in any way predictive, even though he was definitely hinting that they were predictive. There's one where he... Where, it dramatizes a US president using some mega pesticide that causes turbo cancer to win <laughs> to win votes turbo in cancer. <laughs> yeah in in agricult the agricultural parts of the United States and basically the rest of the world economically sanctions the US for using this this pesticide and you know, as, as an aside, like, like, fuck, China and India wouldn't be using the same pesticide. They don't give a shit. Like, yeah. the US is going to be using it. They'd be using it too. Um, and eventually it leads to nuclear war, which, <laughs> which I found really yeah. funny. <laughs> that using mega cancer causing pesticides was the, the cause of, of global nuclear war. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah, I... I actually found the section of offering hypotheticals probably the the bluntest Ehrlich gets in presenting, mm. 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 in basically demonstrating what this book is for. Because this book is this book exists to make you viscerally want to support reducing the human population by authoritarian means. Effectively, we we can get into his proposed yeah. solutions, which are are both hand wavy, but also it's fairly clear what he wants, but. With, with these these vignettes about the future, they exist purely to make you dread the future and support extreme interventions in, in terms of reducing the population. And are not, none, none of them happened. The, the, there was no future or no future that actually occurred remotely resembles these. Yeah, there was a. Do you, there do was you want, a uh, which specific bits of his argument do you want to get into? Because I beyond, there's, there's a bunch of what things. I said. Mm. There's. Oh, I was trying to find. There was a book that I read oh, a couple of years ago. It wasn't. This changes everything. It was. Uh, it was another one where the whole premise of the book. Um, if anybody can. Oh, donut economics! What a bunch of bullshit! Sorry, I just I'm looking at like <laughs> top environmental. Anybody? Okay, anybody who proposes some anything like circular economic stuff or like donut economics or whatever, like, and, and they're a quote unquote economist, they should immediately like have their thesis like rescinded. Um, so, <laughs> so. Anyways, so I'll stop looking for the book. Basically, it was a book where it's just like it was just like it was like ten chapters where this guy just went around and talked to like a bunch of I don't know, ecologists and stuff and like uh, basically what's the worst this could get? <laughs> you know, it's like okay, yeah. like imagine those wildfires in like California. Okay, imagine those like ten times bigger. <laughs> it was just like it was just like <laughs> just it was just a it was just a smorgasbord of of catastrophe uh and i remember being very mm. distressed by that book um anyways uh yeah the uh well where, where should we jump in i guess so the first thing to note so okay two things maybe not an argument the first thing is like uh an asymmetry in i don't think it's a human psychology thing i think it's actually just the nature of problem solving i think there's an asymmetry in in like the structure of the world uh in in that it's very easy to imagine problems or it's also very easy to imagine current problems getting worse so it's it's really easy to do that it's easy to come up with hypotheticals that are really bad but it's really hard to come up with a solution <laughs> it, that's that's really that's mm. really difficult and that's why people who do come up with solutions to these sorts of problems 
you know, get paid a fuckload of money <laughs> in some circumstances, mm-hmm. or they win Nobel Prizes, or they they become known uh, amongst the other billion people or 8 billion people on the planet as, like, you know, yeah. like, very important special people, you know, like, um, because uh, solving problems is really, really hard. Like, a, a really good example is, um, uh, like, HAPA, the HAPA process, um, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. Uh, is... Is uh, I don't know if it's still used today, but presumably some sim- some derivative of like the original Haber process is used today to create like the fertilizers that we use, um, nitrogen. Um, uh, what is it like? Uh, getting the nitrogen out of the air or whatever, making it usable. Now, admittedly, he was using it to make bombs, but <laughs> so, you know, maybe. But yeah, whatever. The right we, idea. He was depopulating yeah. the earth before <laughs> Ehrlich had that idea. But I'm sure I'm sure like a thousand times as many people have been saved by that person's like. Um, knowledge creation than like have been killed by the use of for bombs. So, mm. uh, but maybe that's a bad example. But there are other, 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 plenty of other people who are very important, um, and we remember them, like Alan Turing, uh, because, mm. uh, you know, like what was Turing working on? Turing was working on uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 decision problem, right? The the like these mathematical problems. Um, uh, put forward at like the beginning of like the 20th century and they're all really, really hard. And he basically figured out that like there's class problems that like it's, there's this issue of like there's certain types of mathematical problems that are undecidable. Um, and uh, that stumps like the world's smartest mathematicians for like decades. Um, that's how hard that problem was. And he figured it out mm. and, <laughs> and now he's remembered for it and goddamn right. So there is this, M- there is this like, uh, this asymmetry. And I think people like, whether it's like Naomi Klein or, um, Danella Meadows of, uh, limits to growth, um, or Malthus or Ehrlich or whatever, they, they, are they're, they don't, they haven't clocked this asymmetry. They haven't clocked this asymmetry and they haven't realized that they're on this, they're like on the side of not really solving it or, or they're mm. like, I don't know how to put it, but like they haven't clocked this asymmetry and I don't feel like their efforts are really going towards solving the specific problems that they're pointing out. Yeah, I think there's that asymmetry and I think a large part of the asymmetry comes down to the fact that the, the space of action that within which you can not propose solutions, but just basically describe a problem over and over again is a lot larger than the space of actions that are solutions to the problem. Like that solution space Mm. is a lot more Mm. limited. Say for example, a Mm. flight of like the human flight, for example, say how, how do you make a machine that allows a human to fly? Mm. Mm. The solutions to that are limited by physics. We've got a bunch of different Mm. approaches. We've tried like hot air balloons fixed wing aircraft we say even the difference between a helicopter and a plane like there are a bunch of different ways to solve that problem but it is it's quite limited that you can very clearly get it wrong but mm. you yeah. can propose a bunch of ways that you could do it and not instantiate them that's way bigger and in the same way describing catastrophic futures is quite it's it's quite an unconstrained system. It's not hard. Like yeah, I could true. describe yeah. to you, you a hundred catastrophic futures right now, and it, it just wouldn't be that difficult. You can you keep making them up. Whereas describing or coming up with concrete solutions that, when instantiated, do what you want them to do, that's a lot more limited. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's like it. It might still be. There might be still be an unlimited number of solutions. I'm not sure, but your process that goes into making them is severely constrained. You have to yeah. obey physics. In the, uh, when, when you're talking about like quantum mechanics, like, like the, um, like actual quantum mechanics as in like whoever it's like breakthrough, not as in all this quasi, like, as in, as in wisdom of the dolphins, unlocking the secrets <laughs> no, of the holographic no, universe. No, by that's, that's just as bullshit as wave function collapse. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, so yeah, any, anybody like that, uh, 
Okay, so there's uh, this idea of like the measure of so you can have two infinities, right? But one is bigger than the other, and that's because of like mm, mm. you know, like you know, like it's to do with like putting elements of each set in correspondence with the other and that sort of stuff. Like, um, and also to with like sort of like I think about it geometrically, like <clears throat> like you can have um, say the say the the segment between like the number zero and the number. Um, I don't know, like two <laughs> uh, uh, or the number three. Mm. So you've got three subsegments, and you could say like um, there's an infinity of points between zero and one, and there's an infinity of points between um, one and one and three. Um, but the the total measure of um, points between one and three and zero and one is greater. So like there's not really more points, but it's it's a, it's a, they they use the word measure as the greater measure. Um, so there might be a greater measure of like ways that we could come up with catastrophes, even if there are an unlimited mm. number of solutions to things. Um, and because of that, mm. like mm. dominance, like it's just like really hard to. But also like there's so with regards to constraints, that's a really interesting point. Um, the one constraint that the people who come up with imagining all the crazy shit that ha could happen, they don't, they let themselves get off with not having one constraint in particular, which is the constraint that uh, people solve problems. Like that's a constraint. That's an important constraint. Mm. Like can people solve problems? And if so, are they going to solve this problem? And they always just ignore that. So what they do is they like extrapolate out all the bad stuff and then they don't say it, but implicitly what they're saying is for some reason, people won't solve this problem. They won't choose to, they are unable to mm, or mm. something. And it's always left out, but they never deal with that. Ehrlich, Malthus, all of them, like all of them, not a single goddamn one of them ever says, hey, everything I'm about to say over the next 300 pages is predicated on the assumption that no individual or group can or will go and solve any of the problems that I'm, that I'm about to talk about. I've never yeah, once said any the, of them preface the there, what they're about to say with that. Absolutely. It's the assumption that for the first time in human history, humans are going to be in a situation that is uncomfortable or unpleasant and we'll just <laughs> go, do anything about it. <laughs> wow, this is, this is bad, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's it. There, there, there'll be no modification of behaviour to try to rectify the problem. Yeah, yeah. So It's sort of, it's, it's in the way that you, this thinking is everywhere. There's one guy... Yeah. I'm sorry, I'll probably mispronounce his name, like Peter Zian or Zihan, something like that. He's a Yeah, yeah. I've come across his thinking before. He th Zion. thinks about basically global politics with mm, particular mm. emphasis on Oh, here's the collapse of the energy US or something, isn't he? Like... Oh no, the opposite. The US is always gonna be fine. Um right. and his thinking often irritates me because he'll propose he'll observe something that is real, like like for example, say in Germany, they they are in a position where they they can have a hard time getting raw materials, particularly energy or materials with with which to generate energy. And from that, extrapolate a future where they just collapse, where yeah. they just become <laughs> stagnant or go backwards, on the basis of that. Yeah. And just and he's American and is very very much. He's he's he has drank deeply of the American exceptionalism Kool Aid, where yeah. Americans, whenever they're confronted with a problem, he ascribes to them a an agency for solving problems, which is correct. That that, that is what people do when presented with a yeah. difficult situation. They can modify their behaviour with respect to that problem, and hopefully it will be constructive and they'll get out of it. But then every other country, like, for example, Germany, with respect to resource constraints, he doesn't seem to extend that same sort of agency to and just seems mm. to think, oh, they're going to behave in 50 years exactly the same way that they are behaving at this point in time mm. and they'll be, they'll be fucked. And it's like, well, yeah, if you cease to respond to environmental cues... You some, <laughs> you'll get into for trouble for some unknown reason. So that there's there's yeah. two types of. But, but the thing is, yeah. that's just that is absolutely not reflective of how humans behave, or just any animal behaves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's... it's that whole like, oh, if you boil a frog slowly in water, it boils to death and dies. Which it's it like, that's completely untrue. It jumps out of the water. Yeah. <laughs> it's just 
It's it's just one of these brain worms. It's completely yeah. fucking stupid. How did Al Gore um, like get away but with it, that? But but this sort of thinking you see everywhere, and it just it blows my mind that no one. Well, these people so often will get into a position where they don't acknowledge that people will modify their behaviour in response to stimuli. Yeah. It's, 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 it's an insight that children are privy to. <laughs> like, yeah. I just, I, at what point do you unlearn this? You, you have to... Um... It's so... like if it's cold outside, I'll put on a coat. It's... Like, it, Human solving problems. It, it, it's just it's that same insight applied to other things. I, just, I don't understand how you don't see this. There's um there are two there are two types of closely related fallacies. Well, I think one is a subset of the other. So the 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 or is an element of the other. So one class of fallacy is, is something along the lines that like in some way there's uh, that humans are mechanical. They're not whether it's a humans in general or like um, a particular type of human. Um, that uh, we are mechanical, like evolutionary psychologists fall into this a lot, um, uh, and they don't account for like creativity and problem solving. Um, so the basic fallacy is, and look, I'm not denying that there's like issues around like, you know, like where we have inborn, I don't know, like what you, inborn ideas, like um, mm, mm. Pro- proclivities that might m- may be encoded in our DNA or epigenetics or whatever um and uh but like fundamentally like humans are are creative and the position that humans are not creative is uh just blatant like blatantly refuted by just the fact that we can create new ideas that haven't existed in the culture before like general relativity (laughs) <laughs> like didn't exist mm, before mm. Einstein then it existed now we can synchronize satellites around the surface of the planet like like yeah, the, yeah. you need creativity as like we don't know what the details of how that works is except the idea that um humans not creative has a bunch of consequences one of which is that like we can't create ideas um, especially not be t- like in particular like other 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 species might be creating some ideas in their bodies or potentially in their culture, but the rate, the pace of idea creation, like Einstein's general theory of relativity is like not even a hundred years ago, right? It was like, was it, did he come up with it in like the 1910s or something? Like, maybe that was a special theory. Like a hundred yeah, years yeah, yeah, yeah. and we've got this like total revolution in like computer like science and physics yeah. and stuff. Like, and sorry, maybe I'm breaking up a little bit. You did, you did a little bit, but you're back. Yeah, sorry. So, like, if you think that we're not creative, it's like, okay, well, how come a global civilization can go from, like, not having universal computers and not having, you know, like, synchronized satellites and not having, like, theory of microbes to, like, within, a, like, a couple of hundred years, which is not enough time for, like, um, genetic evolution to, like, bring these things to life, um, bring these ideas into existence. But not only that, they're just not... They're just not it's just not genetic information. Like it's explanatory information. Um, we don't transfer explanatory mm. information through um, genetic like means. We we do it through like our, our minds and our culture. So um, it's it's incumbent upon those people to somehow explain how we can have a growing, thriving civilization um, without creativity. Like <laughs> to me, it's just completely absurd. Yeah, I think it. On that point, it's it, so you, you said it was about people being mechanistic, and yeah, you can make people Even mechanistic. mechanistic thing. So I when when you say mechanistic, do you mean like so a person encounters some sort of situation and responds in some sort of determined way? Yeah. So, um, how do I put this? Um, because while you think. If that is the case, and I, I, you do see people who, like people are like uh, one of those like forward. little wind up, little clang clang mm. monkeys or something. You know, they're just like here's a pro. Like people just basically have some program, and you just need to figure out what that program is. And it's like, oh, everybody except for the mm. person who's proposing the theory of other people, of course. <laughs> yeah, and I guess if you take it further, so 
it, it, it could be the case that some individual is is highly likely to respond to some sort of stimulus in a certain way, just given their upbringing, given their genetics, et cetera, et cetera. The thing is, even if even if you say, okay, let's just assume that is true, that your behavior is determined, but you can actually still be... It, it depends on how you define creative. If you define creativity as responding to that situation in some sort of... in a complex way that solves some sort of problem... It's not actually all that relevant whether your behavior is determined or not. You still will come up with some sort of solution to the problem. Suppose Turing's behavior was totally determined. The fact is you still had that, you know, the, 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 that stable phenomenon of Alan Turing came into contact with his environment and generated certain highly generalizable insights that we are still using. It doesn't strike me as actually hugely relevant whether mm. someone's behavior is determined or not. They're still solving problems. Mm. Like we, that doesn't remove our capability to solve problems. Mm. And then, uh, yeah, it's really interesting. I think um, in order for a culture to have extremely static behavior um, within the individuals of that culture, there has to be um, uh, in incredibly... Uh, resilient memes or ideas that um, are basically m making making it a static society. So, like, mm, and mm. and even then, they're still being creative. Like, the individuals in a static society are still being creative. It's just the the object of their creativity is how to best outcompete the other people in the society to like um, reinstantiate those static memes instead of like coming yeah, up with new, yeah, yeah. new critical memes. Um, and so like, for example, like um, in, uh, you know, like uh, like in China, for example, like in the static part, you know, there's a lot of really open and amazing parts of China for sure. But like within, let's say, like pol the political establishment um, and the CCP, like <clears throat> uh, Xi Jinping is like, he is the most creative person in that structure. It's just that structure in order to be successful in, in, in that you have to be like whatever he needs to be like ruthless and, and so forth. And uh, that you could say the same of like any, any static society, like um, where there's like society like thousands of years ago in like some part of the world where <clears throat> they've just been doing the same thing as their ancestors for tens of thousands of years. It's like, okay, well, so each generation like needs to figure out how to creatively conform to um, the existing ideas rather than come up with new ideas. Um, so then there's a specific type of um, uh, non-creative uh, fallacy, which is, I think you could call it like the Moloch, you know, Moloch, um, the mm, like mm, mm. demon or whatever. Um, like Moloch is like some system, <laughs> some system. And yeah, everybody- maybe explain for listeners what you mean by that. Like you've used it in a bunch of previous Moloch. episodes, but in case someone's jumping in for the first Moloch. time. Moloch. A Moloch um, is uh, from the Bible, uh, the Hebrew Bible. It says uh, the Bible strongly condemns practices that are associated with Moloch, which are heavily implied to be child sacrifice. So basically, it's like one of the Canaanite go gods or something like that. Um, you know, like the ancient Israelites um, are not really like you know they talk a lot of shit about the Canaanites and the Hittites and stuff. So you know, like maybe Moloch was actually a good guy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but at least from the perspective of a Moloch is basically like a big bad thing <laughs> yeah, that that you that should be you scared invoke. of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and normally that you invoke when you want to do something, when you want to justify some sort of behavior. Yeah, and so you could think of like you're, you're fighting against some sort of Moloch. you know, like the Moloch that seems to be around like my social circles because like you know you wouldn't think it, but like like most of my family and stuff are like quite quite left leaning, and um and they make they make fun of me for not being completely left leaning. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like the big, the big, uh, the big Moloch in, 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 in those sorts of social circles is quote unquote capitalism. It's like capitalism some, somehow programming people to like do whatever it is they're doing and like destroy the environment and stuff. And, um, and there's no, it's like this system, whatever it is that we're a part of this Moloch is like inescapable. And the, um, the individuals participating in that system are kind of like don't have any agency. They're just going to like mechanically reinforce the system and, and prop up the system. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, 
it, again, it assumes that like the people in the system don't have any sort of like agency or creativity. Or if they, maybe all the people in involved in like capital society could like recognize, oh yeah, this stuff that we're doing is causing a lot of damage and maybe we want to change like the way that we're acting and stuff. And um, we're going to like modify our behavior to like, <laughs> and we're going to get out of the Moloch, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. And yeah. also, no, no, I was yeah. just like to bring it back to the population bomb because I feel like th there's actually not much to this book to explain to listeners beyond the the environment is being degraded we're running out of food we're running out of resources because the population's too big mm. and actually one one thing methodologically about this book that i i dislike is that and it, it, it's it's similar to what you were saying earlier about problem solving is that early is very very pessimistic about the ability of people mm. to hmm. to act in certain ways to alleviate the problems that he has laid out mm. and the real problems that he's laying he out. He doesn't have particularly high regard. So for he people. says, for example, our the the our ability to grow more food or to produce more calories to feed people, we cannot overcome this problem of not having enough food, and. Were we even to be able to make more food, then our efforts would inevitably lead to all these second, third, fourth order effects. You, can, you can continue on, which are negative, which will totally undercut our effort to make more food. Now, mm. you, you take that sort mm. of thinking and apply mm. it to s possible solutions to any of the other problems he, he says exist. What he then does is... Having disparaged a human's ability to solve problems and acknowledged our very real inability to think through all of the consequences of our actions, he doesn't extend that to himself because he then will go on to having disparaged basically our ability to interact with any complex system without fucking everything up. He then proposes basically a supranational body that will impose constraints on population growth yeah without think without extending that same um that skepticism of a human's ability to interact with a complex system to his own thought <clears throat> because to my mind establishing an authoritarian supranational body to limit population growth using a number of measures he proposes some, but his solutions do feel a lot more hand wavy. We can get into the specifics yeah. of his solutions after this. Having proposed this, he doesn't seem to think, oh, maybe this will have a bunch of significant uh, consequences. Second. Answer. So, for example, yeah. if you yeah. if you go from a society which generate which, which grows, it could be slow growth, a society which is positive. Some, if you go to a a, a society which is say, neutral growth, things become zero-sum. So say anything that one person gains has to be taken from someone else. Someone else needs to become reciprocally poorer in resources. Mm -hmm. To a degrowth society, say, which is negative-sum, so <laughs> everyone's losing stuff, anything you gain has to be lost by someone else plus a bit extra. Mm. Um so in, in a society like that, that just sounds like a recipe for mass violence. Mm. Mm. So pe people will compete for resources even more fiercely. I suppose he'd say, well, if you, just, if you reduce the population at a greater rate than you're reducing growth, then you've still actually got a positive sum society. So I guess you could play that. Maybe. I mean, I'm always pretty skeptical. Until population like... hits zero. Like you've, you've still actually got... Yeah, you've got limits on that that too, but that's just one example of there. Are, he doesn't seem to think that he is subject to these same constraints, this same intense pessimism and skepticism about a human's ability to interact with a complex system mm -hmm. without fucking everything up. Mm -hmm. Similarly, he doesn't seem to his. He, he definitely acknowledges that you can have, say, third-order effects from some sort of intervention in a complex system, but he, all, he, he then doesn't seem to similarly acknowledge that you can have third-order problem-solving from 
an initial starting point of problem solving. Mm -hmm. That is to say, you try to solve a problem in a complex system, that solution will itself cause problems because you're perturbing that system. Mm -hmm. Not all of those perturbations will be things you want or things you even predicted. And say a second order solution, so to speak, will be you trying to solve those problems caused by your first solution. And he doesn't he doesn't extend that that thinking in the same way as yeah. he extends his thinking of causing problems in a complex system. It's we've seen this with a lot of people we've covered on this podcast, where they they don't subject themselves to the same constraints that they subject mm. everyone else to. Mm. He he seems to be this singular force outside of his his model of human agency mm. Mm. which i i just i just don't take very seriously yeah 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 for sure it's um it's always a uh red flag when somebody proposes um you know like what would you call it like simple simple polynomial equations with few variables to explain just radically complex phenomena. <laughs> it's just, it's just like, yeah, it's yeah. Just like <laughs> there was this, um, there's a really good example of this. I can't remember what the equation is called exactly, but um, look, look it up if you want it. It's something to do with like the, the relationship between like this model, like modeling, um, uh, wolf populations and rabbit populations in, in an ecosystem and uh, an early model of this uh this 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 problem i guess is like okay um rabbit population goes up more food for the wolves wolves come along eat the rabbits eat too many rabbits not enough rabbits for the wolves wolves die wolf population goes down more and you just kind of like do this like oscillation over time it's like yeah in an ecosystem where those are the only two things that interact and that matter <laughs> and that yeah. the, there's like there's so many assumptions that go into that and um and where there's also where there's no evolution you know like <laughs> um and and so forth so that's a you know people people in complex systems modeling use that as an example of like here's a here's the um deficiencies of just using like simple linear equations to describe these sorts of systems or whatever um but you'd think like somebody as uh, scientifically or ecologically adept as Ehrlich is supposed to be or was supposed to be in 1968, he would have thought like, okay, maybe that also applies. Like, I don't know, maybe it was, like, I feel like the critique that I was just talking about is like, has been like known for a very long time. Um, maybe it hasn't. Uh, maybe even back in the 60s, like, yeah, maybe that's like something... Hmm. Maybe that is a, that is like a hindsight, a hindsight that's like where a benefit of like uh, living now that know more about like the deficiencies of of like simple models of complex systems. Um, but uh, the other thing that I wanted to say with regards to what you just said, Jack, was that can I will I be able to get it back out of memory? No, no, I've got a read error. <laughs> <laughs> you just four we've got a cache miss <laughs> sorry mate <laughs> um while i speak because yeah. there's something you said that i def uh, want to respond to think about what you you were going to say like yeah, well. <laughs> try to <laughs> um so when you were talking about models it's a really really important thing to bear in mind that any does any human description of the world is is a model and it is going yeah. to include That's a bunch error. of assumptions it's going to be incomplete None of them are going to perfectly explain the world. Yeah. Some models factor in the complexity of the world better. Some are, are much more predictive. And so that's not to say that the the that wolf eating rabbit model you just proposed is 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 categorically wrong because it will explain some. It's a good place to start. Aspect of the world. It's interesting. It's just yeah. It it has it has very obvious deficiencies. Yeah. But similarly, yeah, much more comprehensive models will themselves be relative to all of the information in the universe like extremely uh just inexact but they they might correspond to whatever reality there is better they might be more predictive more explanatorily powerful 
etc. So th- this is a problem of all models, and it's really important to acknowledge that mm. Mm. all models are simplifications. Mm. Mm. But some of those simplifications are actually very useful mm. or more useful than others. Mm. And Ehrlich applies a real asymmetry in how he values yeah. models. Yeah, that's an interesting in that one. Yeah. Basically, every model that disagrees with him is stupid <laughs> and a consequence of human frailty. But then his very simplistic <laughs> models of like, okay, well, you've got all of these problems. What do we do? Well, if we just reduce the human population, it all gets better. Mm. So that model is very simplistic and he's not nearly as rigorous in looking for second order effects and extend that out mm, mm. in his own model as he is in looking at basically every other model. It was so it's actually something I was saying in the episode we had on selective breeding and the birth of philosophy about people apply doubt very differentially and he applies doubt to his own models of the world quite sparsely. <laughs> Uh, when compared yeah. to applying doubt to basically every other model of the world or any other exhibition mm. of human agency in solving problems in the world. And mm. that mm. Is, is just a fairly unscientific approach to the world. And of course, yeah, everyone, I, I don't exempt myself from this, I exempt no one from this, everyone is going to be more generous in evaluating models that you just instinctively agree with but yeah. it's important to to bear that in mind to bear in mind that you have your own biases and at least try to work around them which he he didn't do in or, writing or, or at least 200 pages or at least be willing of, to of, admit of self hagiography here uh, or at least be willing to admit when you have just point blank being refuted by yeah. the empirical facts just completely got it <laughs> to wrong. just admit all right i got yeah, it wrong yeah, sorry yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that's it. It makes me take him less seriously as a scientist. Yeah, it's kind of hard to take somebody seriously. Yeah, when 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 you're presented with yeah with with very categorical evidence that your predictions didn't come true. Yeah, for you to to just refuse to acknowledge that. Um, That's when I think people really are more activists than scientists, and like that's. It's fine to be an activist rather than a scientist, but he certainly presents himself as a scientist yeah. in being an activist, which I find very irritating. Yeah, it'll be like in 50 years How about if, we talk um, if oh, Bitcoin sorry. still isn't the dominant currency in the world. Like, I'll admit that I was wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll admit, I'll admit. Uh, but, um, yeah, he did. You'll, you'll I guess, admit uh, that, that Trump is the future of crypto in a funny way, like, currency. <laughs> you know what's funny about it though is uh there there is this element of like skin in the game you know um for, for people mm. who haven't read about skin in the game it's basically like whether or not you bear the consequences of like your decisions or your the your point of view or whatever. Mm. Mm. um and, and in particular then bear the negative consequences so when you have a um a decoupling of of uh decision making and uh consequence bearing you have all sorts of weird issues occur and uh there's two types of consequences obviously for any any decision there's like positive consequences and there's there's negative consequences and you you see like for example like in the 2008 like financial crisis there are a lot of people who were very happy to like take on the positive consequences for their risk taking but then like socialize the negative consequences and so it fucks up the system and uh the people who should have gone bled dry didn't um and uh, like I think a lot of the same sort of thing happens in in academic publishing and in academic activism sort of activism y sort of stuff. Like Ehrlich is like he doesn't have to bear the consequences of the negative decisions or the the negative consequences of the decisions and policies and stuff that were made based on his advice and his guidance and his 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 arguments. Um, he still got to have his illustrious academic career and. Uh, publish mm. and be respected in his circles and so forth and he could just kick the can down the road on the predictions bear no no negative consequences for for this stuff but then um, whatever policy decisions that are regress that were regressive that affected people all over the world they bore the consequence they bore the consequences of the, those decisions and um, <clears throat> and I think that one of the issues, that I noticed in, in academia is that there is this decoupling. There is no skin in the game for a lot of academics and mm. a lot. And 
that's, you might think that's not a big deal if, it, if it's just like an academic who's just like publishing something obscure and is not really listened to, but there's plenty of academics who I, uh, uh, are expert advisors to democratically elected um, like politicians and to non-democratically elected bureaucrats mm. in like senior positions with a lot of power. And those academics um, are having a large impact on society and they, do, they don't have skin in the game but yet they get to have those positions and they get to keep on publishing. And I think that is, that is like a serious issue with like, um, like these, these are uh, these, these academics in like, uh, the environmental environmentalist fields. Um, yeah. I don't know how that gets fixed because like in, in lots of other parts of the world that are a lot more like concrete and uh, what would you say, like uh, just practical. Maybe the feed lo- yeah, feedback yeah. loop is clearer. Like if you're building a bridge, and the feedback loop, if it collapses, like it's really clear, like that's false. And, and, and uh, yeah, the feedback loop is, is broken on, on people in Ehrlich's position in a really... But I don't know how that gets fixed personally, but like, yeah. Other than other than maybe reputationally, like I suppose you, the fact that the like we're grilling him and other people have grilled him, but it doesn't seem to have like stuck. Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we are we are the clear feedback loop. Every academic fears when he, he's, like 90, being, being he's like ninety. He's like the book club from hell. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he did something. Yeah. So for example, I think he had one kid then got a vasectomy. Mm. So that's. That's something. Yeah. yeah, he he. That's what he advised. He advised having, at at most, a replacement number of children, yep. so two children. So he did that. Um, I guess I can respect him for. I'm doing not. That. I'm not <laughs> sure. For example, how much he was flying around the world yeah. and lecturing on, on limiting resource consumption, which seems to be a, a cottage industry of environmentalists flying today. In private jets to Davos yeah. or something. Yeah. 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 To to encourage <laughs> other people to. To limit how much they travel in a, on an international scale, <laughs> which no, I mean that that's kind of an unfair, like that's an irritating thing that some environmental activists do, but that doesn't invalidate some of their concerns. I yeah. guess. <laughs> um, so Paul Ehrlich did modify his behaviour yeah. to some extent that's based on the things he said, but I do agree it's you know, the the reputational damage for getting a bunch of predictions just completely wrong hasn't really been very big so people who don't really have people who if you think of this as a feedback loop don't really feed back on him saying that he got predictions wrong doesn't really affect him because in his field the the feeling really seems to be oh maybe he got some of the details wrong but he's his heart was in the right place and those sort of sentiments are why i consider a lot of environmentalism to be not really a science but more activism because the fact that mm. if you get stuff completely wrong but you are in some way morally pure or your heart's in the right place and that's considered enough mm. and to me that's not that's not what a scientist mm. does mm. yeah yeah so how about we talk about some of his predict or oh, not predictions sorry we talk about his predictions his solutions yeah because this is so just before we jump into predictions, uh, that was where so particularly in sixty eight. Yeah, I, I don't. So we'll, we'll get on to talk about Malthus later and how he was almost there. It's just he he was missing one insight that you can humans technologically can really modify the carrying capacity of a piece of land. Like that's where Malthus was really wrong, and for his time, I think okay, he made a bad prediction. And I'm a bit more sympathetic. It's more when people, after he got it wrong, just keep restating his mistake that I'm less sympathetic. Yeah. We'll talk about <laughs> yeah. that later. Um, but it, Ehrlich was pointing out real problems, problems that still exist, mm. although your birth rates are now negative mm. um, in, in much of the which world. Which he would probably think is a good and, thing, right? Which he'd think is a good thing. Whereas I would and, say that's the problem. That's but the, the, the problem is there are a bunch of things that I think Ehrlich would quite like. Yeah. Say, for example, a welfare state, which is going to be really difficult if you have really negative birth rates. If you have a growing portion of the population who are going to be receiving benefits from a welfare state mm, mm, as mm, they get mm. older and a shrinking number of people who are paying into mm, it, mm. I think 
Like it, barring some profound increase in in productivity, which could happen, mm. but if if things continue as they are today, it it would be a real mm. problem. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's hard to know because predicting the course of technology is hard. Because if you knew in advance what it'd be, then you would invent all of those things right now yeah there's a small number of so, people who get paid a lot of money for being right about that stuff <laughs> and we're not we're not them <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah yeah and i i'm glad that i exist. wish i mean <laughs> i wish maybe one day a you know, book club from hell like uh venture capital <laughs> that and all those patreon yeah. bucks that's where they're We're gonna go. You, Mark Andreessen, <laughs> gonna eat your motherfucking lunch. <laughs> this, is, this is this is our way of raising funds. Uh, it's a it's it's the podcast for yeah, the VC. Podcast for <laughs> so no one's done it before. We are trailblazers. Can you feel the ground uh, swell? What was I saying? The, the the third time. I'll, I'll I'll get it this time. I keep trying to say let's talk about his solutions and then getting completely. So side-tracked his solutions are with with with, with brilliant knowledge approaches to raising he, funds um, for venture capital but he, uh, his solutions are dumb he's uh i'll try to be generous but his solutions are the perfect combination of being definite enough that i can disagree with them being hand wavy enough that i don't know how you'd instantiate any of these on the basis of what he's written here his solutions are all variations of we've we have to coerce people to have fewer children. Because at least in this book, he's saying humans have this hardwired biological drive to just have as many kids as possible. And in 2024, so he didn't see 2024. So Mm. there's a big caveat. Mm. But in 2024, people are just not replacing themselves in most of the world um, by having children. It's just just not happening. So is that a part of uh, our knowledge? No. No, no, it's not because there are. There's always been people in in uh, in society who have voluntarily removed themselves from the gene pool, monks. Yeah. yeah so like, if that, even that's just wrong. Like, you could have made it. Like, it yeah, would actually, it would it would take in, all in, the two in, seconds. In the Catholic think, Church, yeah. there was there was a a a very large, very wealthy portion of the population in Europe that actually just that who voluntarily made members of it. Yeah. Do yeah. This. So. It yeah, takes you, all you of become a... a Catholic priest. You're not. You're not having babies, or you're not meant to. It's frowned yeah. on. If uh, <laughs> if with your vow of celibacy you get someone. And there's pregnant. been like there was that there was this funny uh there was like an there was this uh it was in Italy or something there was like a uh a, a faction of like this very strange Catholic faction that was like eunuchs. They're like uh, voluntary eunuchs back in like this like hundreds of years ago and you just think like that doesn't sound like it would last very long and i don't think it did i don't know if they still exist <laughs> you'd have a hard time marketing that <laughs> yeah look it's you know it's, it's one thing people today getting vasectomies when they were in their 20s because they say oh i'm just never going to want kids so get mm. my vas deferens mm. snipped which i think is kind of dumb um you know I, I didn't want kids for quite a while and until i did and i'm I'm glad I was able to do that. Mm. But like completely removing not only that, but your testosterone production as well would be pretty fucking bad. (laughs) That'd suck. (laughs) So he, um, Berlika decomp, he has this, and it's pretty obvious, right? It's like, okay, you've got birth rate and you've got death rate. And if birth rate is greater than death rate, then you're going to have population growth. And the greater that difference, like the faster you're going to have population growth. Uh, And so... (laughs) So those are our two knobs that we can mod- like uh, fiddle with, and uh, uh, and he he says like he calls them like euphemistically he says okay death rate solutions and birth rate solutions. <laughs> yeah, and this is part of what really like, irritates me with fucked. his solutions because he doesn't he presents himself as being super hard headed and ruthless. So when he talks about say improvements in medical care reducing the death rate. And this is a bad thing for the population. He's presenting himself as someone who's willing to go to those hard places. And I think, fine, okay, if you want to, if you want to redu- view reduced infant mortality as a bad yeah. thing, that's, that's a, a perspective. I don't share it, but it's consistent with the rest of his thesis. So fine, I'll, sure. I'll grant him that. But 
when it gets to when it gets to things that would make his solutions much more unpopular, he's suddenly much more tentative in following the very obvious following like line of, propositions yeah. through to their their conclusion. So, for example, he ha- he says, "Okay, well, governments need to be limiting the population, limiting the number of children people have." The question is, okay, someone has more than their allotted number of children. What do you do? That's very uncomfortable. He's not willing to follow that. <laughs> it was like with the like with the the one child policy in China. That they they did follow it. So they they would kill babies if if it were over the number of children that that someone was meant to have. And if you're going to pursue a policy like that, they were pretty upfront about it. It's like, yeah, that's that's what we're going to do. They were willing to follow it through to its yeah, it's it's conclusion. What what are the implications of this? However, early suddenly becomes squeamish when it when it comes to telling yeah. people what it really yeah. means to enforce population control. And that also irritated me. If you're going to propose this, be up front. Like we're going to fucking kill some babies. We're going to kill some babies. Yeah. <laughs> if you put together yeah, his contention we'll that people <laughs> people are just going to breed. People are just going to keep pumping out babies unless you stop them. So if you, if you if you take that assumption, plus his solution of we need to limit the number of babies people have, well, if you put those two things together, then you're going to need to kill some babies. And he doesn't. He's not willing to follow that through. He's not willing to talk about the bits of his contention that are going to be really unpopular. Yeah. Again, because I think he was more of an activist than a scientist. Or a or forced sterilization. Yeah. Which again, like, doesn't yeah. fly very like. And <laughs> with a he, lot of people like, says, Are you going to sterilize me? <laughs> so, no, <laughs> not a big fan of that solution. <laughs> not really. I, <laughs> I, I, I want to have that ability in reserve if it ever if it ever comes to it. If there's ever a future where I'm the only man left on Earth and the rest of the earth is populated by millions of beautiful women. Jack will do it. And I've duty. got to take one for the team and save the human race. <laughs> I I I will take it upon myself to do the hard work. Look, honey. I don't want to do it. I don't want to. I know. I know. I, know, I don't honey. want to do this. I don't want to, but it is my yeah, this is my, my, my duty cross to, to bear. humanity. But I've <laughs> I've got to sleep with 200 gorgeous women perhaps, today perhaps to at the same time humanity. just and as I, a matter of efficiency simultaneously maybe all at maybe all at once <laughs> and i look i'm going to keep that ability in reserve i'll keep that one up my sleeve in case the worst happens and i've got to do that's yeah. the kind of guy yeah, i yeah, am yeah. this is why people should buy Tau, <laughs> the book i wrote because i am such i am so morally pure that I'm willing to not have a vasectomy just in case the world is populated only by beautiful women and I'm the only fertile man left on earth. I will do that, which is why I think everyone should go to Amazon right now and buy a copy of Tower. And Jack will use all the, anyway, the, the, what the revenue talking from about? all those sales to uh, jump in a private jet to Davos and promote this point of view. Buy Viagra <laughs> so, that, so I can just keep going forever. So, um, yes, yeah, so... What's uh? What's another um, one? like another obvious? Like, there's so many. As soon as you go down this line of thinking, there's so many obvious solutions. So it's like, why didn't? Why? Why? Why won't you just fess up and just say like these are part of the solution space? You know, let's just kill a bunch of people. Let's just round a bunch of people mm. up and kill them. You know, that's part of the solution space. Why don't we just like go full Penty Linkler? Or why don't we just like start just introducing massive economic sanctions on like the parts of the world that we don't like and just starve them to death or whatever? Or why don't we just like uh, do mass forced sterilization? Yeah. So he, like- he kind <laughs> of he kind of goes towards that because he says, okay, one thing that so he divides the world into overdeveloped countries, underdeveloped countries, and he says one thing that overdeveloped countries should do is make the provision of aid, any sort of aid, contingent upon instituting population control measures. Mm. So he goes some of the way. But part of the reason why I'm much less sympathetic to Ehrlich than I am to someone like Penty Linkler is that I don't want to live in a world that Penty Linkler would have devised, but Linkler is very honest about the implications of what he's saying. He's more intellectually honest than In that Ehrlich, he says yeah. straight up, yeah, yeah, like, cut off all aid to poor countries so a bunch of them die uh we might need to kill a bunch of people 
we will need to institute a totalitarian society dedicated towards making sure that people don't accumulate resources or don't want to accumulate resources. He's very open about yeah. where his his first principles That's go. That's a lot more Which makes me a lot more sympathetic. In terms of like, Ehrlich yeah. just, at least... Whereas Ehrlich it, it comes off as continuously like... tries to weasel out of saying what, what his proposed yeah. solutions really mean. Were they to be implemented? It feels, um, what would you say, like, yeah, just a bit slimy, doesn't it? Like, does <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it's Penty Linkler, so. Again, he's he's an activist dressed up as a scientist. In terms of, it's so actually one part of the book that I found very funny, and I get this comes back to the activism part again. Is towards the end, he provides a bunch of scripts for talking to different people about not having children. And I found this part really funny because it he, he thinks through, you know, oh, what do you say to someone who's really conservative? What do you say to someone who's really liberal? Both of these within the American political context. What do you say to someone who's a member of a minority group? What do you say to someone who's an environmentalist? What do you say to someone who's a, a, a quote-unquote dove, that is someone who's very anti-war? How do you talk to all of these different types of people to convince them not to have children? I found that part quite funny, his, his proposed scripts. But in, in, in terms of things to tell listeners about, there's not really any information <laughs> to convey. It's, you, you could probably imagine already how he would approach all of these different people. Is there more you want to say about the book itself? Because it's, it's sort of hard to talk about for an extended period because there's not, there's not much to it. It's basically saying the same fairly simple point over and yeah, over again. Yeah, one of the points is uh, whether or not like, I just disagree with him that population increase is a problem. I think it's a good thing. I don't, I don't think it's a problem. And the, even mm. just the frame, like, the, it's, that's why it's, it's, in, it's inherently anti-human because he thinks that more people is, is bad. Like, people are bad and having more of us is bad. <laughs> Whereas I think more mm. people, people are good, people are creative, people solve problems and... The more people we have and the more like freedom they have uh, and the more uh, wealth and technology they have, the better. And the more we can solve each other's problems and then also so solve these other problems that we care about, like environmental problems. So I want more people. I, w I want like more people to be born more quickly and I want them to be born with like more wealth and more technology and more education and more political freedoms. And uh, that's like, it's like diametrically op the opposite of what like Ehrlich uh, is proposing so i i disagree with him mm. that it is a problem i think he's miss i don't even know what if there's a correct word it's not exactly that there's a misdiagnosis there's a miss there's a uh, there's a, a a misinterpretation of a phenomena as a problem i don't think it's a problem i think it's a good thing and uh and yeah i think that's like a fun fundamental difference between me and like a lot of mm. environmentalists yeah he his first principles are very, very different to my own. Um, maybe then, maybe we should talk about Malthus, okay. because if we contextualize things by talking about Malthus, we can then get in, onto all of those other questions. Because I think what he's basically a less interesting Malthus in 1968. So Thomas Thomas Malthus. I, I imagine most people have at least heard the name Malthus, but Thomas Malthus was an English, I think he was a clergyman, he was an economist, and he wrote this book, or an essay, so an essay on the principle of population in 1978. And his, it's an empirical observation, and the observation is not incorrect, and I'll get into where I think he ultimately went wrong, but he observed that basically... In England at the time, people would make people would farm more food. There was this relationship between agricultural production. As that went up, you would have a, an increase in population as you were able to feed more people. Eventually, the population would increase faster than your ability to farm more food would, and you'd get a crash in population as people weren't be, being able to be fed. And then that process would restart. So the population would basically be this sawtooth pattern of you know, increase, 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 then you hit the limit of your food, decrease. Increase, 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 hit the limit of your food, decrease. And that 
it, it's not an incorrect observation of what was going on. Where his so where he was when people talk about Malthus being disproved, what he didn't really acknowledge or what wasn't factored in enough was that we're able to change the carrying capacity of a given piece of land in a way that he just he just didn't imagine. Yeah. And I guess so does that mean I guess in at the absolute limit, I guess Malthus is correct in that there's just a a finite amount of space that you can you can stack human beings in the biosphere. But Short of that, we actually can increase the food, the your your ability to produce food in a given plot of land, a lot, and Ehrlich fell into the same trap because the population bomb is overall about the relationship between food production and population. Mm. He'll talk about environmental. He does talk about environmental degradation, but that's yeah. very much secondary to we are not producing enough food to feed these people, mm. and like. Well, I'm more sympathetic to Malthus because Malthus just made this observation mm. of a relationship between food production and population. Yeah. And then in the at the end of the 18th century didn't didn't acknowledge that we can generate much more food per unit area of land than than he thought. Yeah. Well, um, I, I would even I'm less sympathetic when people Hundreds of yeah. years later, <laughs> just make the same mistake. It's like, well, so, someone has already said what you you were saying. Said it better. Said it with more data. And you're you're just making the same mistake. I'm a lot less sympathetic to Ehrlich than I am to Malthus. I would I would go. F I mean, I th I think like again, this is speaking with hindsight. Like we've got a lot more understanding of the world in our culture than mm. um, Malthus did, uh, but. It's but yeah, before sorry. you say that, Ehrlich has the same hindsight that yeah, we yeah, do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's yeah. just he he refuses yeah, yeah, to ignore yeah, it. exactly, which makes it, it it's harder to be sympathetic towards like uh, Ehrlich and yeah, uh, like all the other people that we've mentioned. Um, but uh, I would probably end. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'm, this is an incorrect frame, but I'm pretty sure this is, this is how I understand it. There's like the carrying capacity of. Um, like an environment is uh is is it's not an intrinsic property of of the, the physical system it's 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 a function of the knowledge that's instantiated there so like if we create new knowledge that'll change what we can get out of that uh environment just like um like you know like on oh hey jack's dropped off ah, it's just levi for a little bit um well, yeah, like the Haber process is a really good example. Like all of a sudden the carrying capacity, quote unquote carrying capacity of, of, of like the world went from, you know, whatever, one to 10 units of, I don't know, just pretend we've got some units. <laughs> Me making it like a classic, uh, uh, just forget about the units, whatever. Uh, but yeah, the creation of that piece of knowledge like changed the carrying capacity of the world. So like... Um, it's at least as much to do with the knowledge that's instantiated in the environment as the actual physical substrates. And which is, which is again, like where I draw, like there's, there's an important difference between raw materials and resources, uh, like raw material, you could just mm. say it's just the atoms itself, um, uh, and the energy and so forth. But like whether or not something is a resource is, uh, a function of our knowledge or, you know, in the biosphere, it'd be like the genetic mm. knowledge. And, you know, again, I, I probably said this on, on the show before, but like a long time ago, like <clears throat> the classic example of this is uh is like oil. So or like methane gas like coming out of uh coming out of uh like the ground. Uh in certain parts of the world you have like these sort of jets of flame coming out. Th those areas were like toxic for a very long time and they weren't resources. They were just like horrible places uh, that you couldn't grow anything on. And then all of a sudden we created the knowledge about like um, how to use uh, like hydrocarbons to fuel our engines and stuff. And all of a sudden those became resources. Uh, and yeah, so I, I just think that there's this, there's, there's a fallacy that uh, these people have, which is that the limiting factor is, uh, is the environment itself. And again, like as Jack already said, like maybe at the extreme, at like at the, at, you know, at, at infinity, like if you, 
at some point there's a, there actually is a finite number of atoms in the volume of of the earth <laughs> and like everything inside of in, everything <laughs> inside of the magnetosphere um then like sh- sure but like that's not the situation that we find ourselves in we actually find ourselves in a situation where um i think uh cypher dynamos like did the crunch the numbers on it and he put some estimates on he looked at the total volume of all mines in human civilization all mines so um like not any particular industry but just every single ore that's ever been mined take the total volume of all of that and he he estimated that he thinks we've only used one one millionth of the volume of the planet (laughs) which is equivalent Mm -hmm. like to like that's hard to get your head around like but uh, a visualization that he offered in his book was like imagine like going to an olympic size swimming pool which if i remember correctly is like 12 lanes of like about a meter and a half each so it'd be something like 18 meters wide by like two meters deep by like 50 meters long so it's you know it's, it's it's a million liters or whatever it is comes out to be and he's like okay uh you know like take a a, a teacup <laughs> And then like pour half of it back in what you've got left over in your teacup is the volume is like equivalent to the volume of the earth that we've actually mined. Okay. So, so, Mm -hmm. and, and all, and it's not just like, it's not just like, uh, that has sustained that tiny little volume of the earth that we've mined provides all of the materials that we have used to build this entire civilization thus far. And, uh, mm. The idea that, or oh, we're some, we're anywhere near close, like anywhere near uh, exhausting our mineral deposits is just com- completely fucking absurd. Like when you actually think about it like that, and that's not even taking into account like recycling materials and reusing things and then remining like waste and that sort of stuff. So <clears throat> uh, the world is a really big place. There's lots of resources, and also we're always creating new knowledge about uh, the earth and how to use it. And we're also getting better at like, also we're going through this like dematerialization process at the moment where like huge amounts of the economy, which were previously material, like a physical material now being digitized. So there's also downward pressure on resource Mm. usage for like huge parts of the economy, like, you know, like the use of paper (laughs) for like, um, print material and that sort of stuff. So yeah, there's all sorts of issues with, that constrained view of the environment and human life. Mm. Yeah. And I guess I suppose to that, if, I, if we're going to be um, Ehrlich bot for a bit, so probably two things. He'd say, one, using those resources involves a bunch of negative externalities that cause more problems than they solve. So with environmental degradation. So say with hydrocarbon usage, emitting emitting um, carbon dioxide into the, the atmosphere. So there's, there's that. And then we're not able to solve those secondary problems caused by our interventions. Is like I guess that's what he would say. But I, I, I just don't... Oh, and then also, actually, he, he directly addresses people who say that there can be technological solutions to these problems by basically saying... No, no, he just says there, no. There can't be. <laughs> he just says no. He just says no. Well, that it's it's. He says it's it's utopian. And then, like he, <laughs> he says, he says making he a, says a no. technological solution to something like, <laughs> like having, not having enough of a carrying capacity for a piece of land. Yeah. Which actually that he was proven wrong on. We, the human race has demonstrated that we are able to increase the carrying capacity of a piece of land to support a population of what is it like nine billion now? Eight. We just crossed eight. Um, eight. So that like, we, we actually can do that. And then he says that's too complex. But what is not too complex is instituting a supranational body that will limit the population in countries that are competing with each other for resources. And competing with each other so if, if you to just, trade with one another. <laughs> to trade with one another, but also just militarily. Like one way to, yeah, yeah, yeah. to take other people's stuff, which... Human beings are rapacious. We, we'll do that. I, I don't, I'm not sure if that's something you can eliminate from humans. Our acquisitiveness and desire to wage war on each other, to take each other's shit. 
one way to do that is just by having more babies. So you have a bunch of young people, particularly young men, that you can throw at your enemies. I just don't know how you you stop that, how you make an, a multinational body that is just going to stop everyone from doing that. So that's possible. But what is impossible is coming up with a way to grow more food on a, on a piece, yeah. piece of land. Like, to my mind, at least, that second engineering problem is a hell of a lot easier than making people behave in a way that they haven't behaved in for the entirety of human history. Again, this is why, like, uh, people like, like early just... Uh, it just seems a bit silly to me. They don't... I guess there's always a benefit to... Um, yeah, just, like, reading outside of your own field. Like, he just thinks that because he's an ecologist or whatever, he just has, like, the answers to all this stuff. And it's, just, like, economists have... Mm. You know, like, one of the things is, like, any super... You know, that's why... I, one of the things I talk to uh, people about when I talk, 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 talk to people about Bitcoin is like, um, you know, like the, the high pessimism. Okay. Just like bear with me, Levi, imagine Levi, like there's like a government intervention that just completely bans out, bans the Bitcoin and uh, shuts the Bitcoin down. And it's like, yeah, so you're going to, you're assuming a cartel, essentially you're assuming, you're assuming that the governments form a cartel and, that none of the governments um, defect from the cartel, even though they're all strongly incentivized to, and that mm-hmm. yeah, that's also in the face of like there's never in the history of the planet been uh, the sort of um, cohesive long-term collaboration and coordination between the governments to the to the extreme point that these people propose would be needed to like shut down bitcoin you're like talking all the governments on the world in the world like coordinate together um to shut down bitcoin even though they're incentivized not to and it's like okay well when was the last time every single one of the governments like coordinated with one another to do anything <laughs> like <laughs> yeah and, and it is so it's like when there is when there is apparent coordination it is it it tends to be if you're talking about governments governments acting in their own interests which is just totally fine like yeah. when you look at so the united states and china how initially they were they were cooperating because the chinese wanted access to particularly like american technical mm-hmm. knowledge the americans wanted access to cheap labor now it's a bit different because it's now like the americans or just the western world gets access to chinese manufacturing power which is it's still cheap, but it's it's cheaper to do it in Vietnam or something. But now you get access to a bunch of extremely highly educated, technically capable Chinese people. Like that's that's also like you look at where the the collaboration is happening. It's it's where the West can get access to that. Chinese people can get access to highly trained Westerners as well. Yeah. That's where the, the 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 mutual interest crosses over there. Yeah. But then in other things like I don't know, both countries making their economies less competitive with respect to each other by limiting resource usage, for example. Like that, that's just not going to happen. Yeah. And then also... Like the, these two countries aren't going to do that because it just doesn't benefit them at all. And I, I just don't think cooperation based on mutual martyrdom is not a viable yeah. strategy. That yeah. I wouldn't <laughs> pin my hopes on solving global problems on that yeah that's a that doesn't really make any sense especially when you consider also like <clears throat> the counterforce to all of that is um uh what is it a uh, comparative advantage it's just like it's so strongly advent- <laughs> like um incentivized to just have i mean i know there's always issues with like globalization and 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 that sort of stuff but man like just the number of people, hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of poverty in the shortest amount of time. That's, it's just, it's, it's actually, it's actually astounding. Like people don't actually clock it and they think the world's on fire, except like in the last, you know, 40 years or so since the eighties, it's like hundreds and hundreds of millions of people have gone from living on like rations Mm. to actually being able to have like, um, a reasonable amount of food and even like becoming uh like middle class and that sort of stuff you know hundreds of millions of people in in china hundreds of millions of people in in uh in in india like india is a good example from this book you know at the time of writing it was four it had a population of 400 million it's now like 1.2 1.3 not only has the population of india tripled in that time but also like a huge number of 
Indian people are like living extremely wealthy lives, uh, lives that they're, you know, like mm. anybody's ancestors couldn't have, couldn't have like hoped to have lived. A good example of like, just like straight refutation of all of this crap is just like you just pick your standard Australian, just randomly pick an Australian. Chances are they're going to have more wealth and a better, better, better life than any, 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 any like ruler, any like um, king, queen, emperor of Europe or Egypt or Rome or whatever from like hundreds of thousands of years ago, you know, like, you know, you think, you think the, the emperor of Egypt had it good, you know, guy was literally shitting in a hole. Like he, he was, he was, he was fucking poor. He didn't have the internet. Like he was, he was poor and he lived in a, in a giant stone house, um, that took like hundreds of years to build or whatever. And it's just like, okay, your standard Australian is, is going to have like running clean, running water access to the internet <laughs> like cars like things that didn't even exist mm. like 200 years ago and all of that's happened uh whilst the population has exploded and uh so we've got more people we're wealthier and there's more peace there's less death from war and uh also commodity prices are cheaper they're always going down and the basically the thing that always fucks up like this downward trend on like commodity prices and increasing like life expectancy and all that sort of stuff is almost always political intervention where like the political class will come up with some stupid idea about how to like constrain market forces like intervene in the energy sector or like come up with these stupid like free trade like things that like mess up actual free trade um like orwellian free trade agreements that like actually interfere with trade or like whatever and uh, that's mm. almost always the thing that's like messing things up. Like these days, people will die when they die of famine. It's because of, uh, it's like political famine. There's not really, I don't think there's any deaths mm. anymore from like actual like technological base famine. Like they can't create the food. It's because there's like some issues around corruption and that sort of stuff. Um, so the people who think that the world is going to hell in a handbasket have to explain why this is the case <laughs> okay so if i'll be paul ehrlich circa 2024 my guess is to that he'd say it was like i said earlier about the the negative externalities all this growth is contingent upon a climate crisis or creates a climate crisis which will ultimately impoverish us destroy our destroy our cities destroy our way of life because the, the the way that we produce energy to to lead to this this increasing living standards is completely unsustainable and is mm. in the long term destroying our environment and our planet. And the thing is, it's it so I think en the the correlation between energy usage and standard of living is is really tight. Like as you increase energy usage um, in in societies. On the whole, standard of living increases along with it. Doing more stuff. So, and at the moment, our most reliable, highest output, cheap... Oh, solar is now very, very cheap, although it's pretty massively supported by governments. Um, yeah. I, but, I, you know, very, very cost-effective uh, means of, of generating energy is by burning hydrocarbon fuels. So that's... The green energy industry can't, and that, that can't does make have, the claims they do so long as they're receiving the amount of subsidies they are. Yeah, um, but also and also in terms of like you know, how do you, it's one one thing is supplying um, energy to to individuals or to households. Mm. Another is supplying it to industry, mm. Mm. which is is much more energetically demanding than a household. Um, and and the the I think it was Václav Smil who talks about mm. this. Um, so say when people talk about, they, uh, I think quite often the example is given of Denmark mm. of transitioning to mm. non hydrocarbon energy sources. And saying, you know, look, well, they could do it. And his response to that was, you know, what what does Denmark produce? You know, when you consider when you compare it to countries that have large, say, heavy industry um, sectors, um, those sectors do demand a lot more energy. And someone, at least if you want to maintain our standard of living, someone has to make those things. The thing is, too, it. So we, we could come up with a form of energy production that 
is is reliable, is able to generate very large amounts of energy, especially those that fill the demands of industry. Um, it, it's an engineering problem. I feel like a lot of... So one, one thing that does irritate me about a lot of the current responses to to climate change are... So the, the problem is basically that the Earth's getting hotter. <laughs> like that, that's ultimately what's going to cause the problems. Um, and one of the things that contributes to that is releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But all of the, all of the focus, at least at the political level or the, the activist level, really seems to be on reducing carbon emissions. And I don't, I don't deny that that's a, a possible solution. Like that's definitely part of the solution space or part of the potential solution mm. space. But the space of solutions is a lot bigger than that, actually. And it feels like mm. there's now confusion about what the problem is. Is the problem the earth getting hotter or is it carbon emissions? And it feels like a lot of the a lot of discussion now is just focusing on carbon emissions as the problem. And if you just reduce those, then the problem is reduced commensurate to the amount that you reduce carbon emissions. Whereas still as an engineering approach, it strikes me that actually you should be focusing on the earth getting warmer. Like that's actually what causes the problem. Um mm. And that, yeah. like the, the, the solution space for that is pretty big. Yeah, yeah, like carbon sequest- sequestration. <laughs> Man, my tongue. <laughs> I get that one out. Taking yeah, carbon well, out of it. But it'll be multi yeah. the, the way different. that we solve this problem. We're just using alternative energy. So I, like, I don't think it's going to be... It's not going to be one solution. It's one single solution to this global problem. I think... I imagine it's, it's going to be multiple things. There's going to be different ways of generating yeah, energy. Yeah, sure. If you can come up with a way to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and you do that in plenty of ways, like say trees do it, mm. Mm. you could. So there's two. Uh, there's two things. So on pull, that. pulling pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, there are certain like I've I've seen yeah. people proposing, oh well, if you seed the atmosphere with certain chemicals, it'll Ooh, reflect a certain yeah. amount of like, the sun, of solar energy away from the earth. Mm, I feel like that, idea. that could potentially cause more problems yeah. than it solves because <laughs> we do we do. We we are critically dependent on receiving yeah, that solar yeah, yeah, energy, yeah. so I, I'm a That's bit a nervous idea. about reducing that. But <laughs> what I'm saying is is a real a real problem. But the activist mindset seems to be picking one thing from the possible solution space and going, okay, well, I'm going to religiously follow this. Yeah. Whereas I feel like a so a more scientific or an engineering approach to it, which I think is yeah, I'm actually pretty confident that we are going to. Solve if, or at least really mitigate this problem. Yeah, um, I, uh, humans are remarkable at problem solving. I think there's a... it's going to be, it's going to be we're going to engineer a number of different solutions and implement them all at once, rather than just one politically fanciful solution, which is what's proposed at the moment. Which is basically everyone is going to voluntarily make themselves poorer. Which I just just given the incentives for one group yeah. to break away from that cartel and make themselves wealthier. I, I just don't think is fundamentally serious. Yeah, look, I think when, um, <clears throat> at the end of the day, when I uh, go to a hospital, you know, maybe, maybe I have a kid and, you know, they have to be in an incubator or something. I want that hospital running on fucking coal, not fucking solar panels. That hospital's lights better not go out and they better have a diesel backup generator, not a fucking, like, all this crap around, uh, like, it's renewables trying to, like, give us high resilient, like, high high reliability energy. I just think um, that's, that's fine in, in circumstances where, you know, it's not a, like the reliability if you have a brown ale or something, it's not as big deal, but there's plenty of situations where that's not acceptable, like hospitals, military infrastructure, telecommunications infrastructure. There's so many parts. And then there's also just the issue of just like, you know, like oil just, you know, you've always got a half-life with the battery. Oil, just you can just leave it there and it's going to be a battery for fucking ever. Mm. Like there's so many, there's so many good qualities of fossil fuels um like the energy density like the fact that it doesn't degrade the reliability like how you know like for example like with um with a coal turbine energy generation like it's fairly easy to like turn it on and off or like scale it up and down and you don't have to like 
like if you've got a uh, solar and you've got like too much energy coming onto the grid you've got to have like you've got to basically like pump it into batteries or do something with it um so that you don't just like fry the grid there's all these issues and look there's certainly positive parts of like um these other energy sources but the conversation at least if you talk to just a an environmentalist or like listen to some of the quote-unquote green energy advocates it's like it's like they, it's like it's, it's as if like fossil fuels are just like this evil thing that sort of does nothing but like destroy the planet and why are we using it? we're so dumb for it and why don't we move over to these other things it's like i think it's i, I think actually <laughs> the way they describe it i really think you could you could replace how they describe it as and talk about sin instead yeah. and i feel like it yeah it matches quite nicely. It's it's and very. <laughs> there, there are no, like there are no solutions. There are only compromises. There's trade offs. Like every, yeah. yeah, every response to a situation that you try to implement, particularly when it's something with as far reaching effects as human energy generation, yeah. that, that's huge. And the idea that we're going to have like you're going to have positive, you're going to have positive outcomes. So say we talk about hydrocarbon energy, the positive outcomes are yeah, it's really energy dense. Yeah really reliable we've got pretty we've got very mature it's really cheap it's insanely cheap around it it's cheap <laughs> but then we get the pollution but then, like there are downsides yeah. like yeah but there's there's pollution it emits greenhouse gases like those are those are very real yeah drawbacks yeah yeah and and then say with with renewable with renewable energies like you were talking about solar panels running a hospital before so one of the so that drawback is, is about battery technology. Yeah. Like we, yeah. our battery technology is not there yet. Do I think it's impossible for us to make batteries that are really, really good? No, uh, I don't think we can do that. I'm pretty confident that if, well, not only if humans focus on it, we are yeah. focusing on it. Like I'm pretty confident that over the next 10 years, we're going to see some fucking crazy batteries. There already are crazy. Great There's stuff. Some already some pretty amazing batteries in Australia. There's a couple of There's already, already crazy. Yeah. But again, it's like, say... Lithium mining is is dirty. Yeah, there, there are downsides, but again, it's do I think that we can't mitigate those downsides if we really needed to? I think we'd solve those problems too. Those will cause more problems. Yeah. Such <laughs> is human existence. Like it's just a never-ending stream of solving problems, and, and that's that's, half the, that's that's not the fun only of it. okay, <laughs> but I think it's a good thing. That's the fun bit of of being alive. Yeah. So there's a. I, um, a... So it's even with so with back to yep. what you were saying about renewables. I don't even like. I'm not going to discount that no. as a possible solution. Like we, we could the, maybe we'll come up with super that solar cells that... that don't need to be regularly replaced. That either don't require mining of resources that's that's really really dirty, or maybe we come up with a mm, way to mm, mitigate mm. the environmental effects of mining them, those resources. Maybe we come up with a way that you don't need to turn over solar panels so quickly, or maybe they're more efficient. Maybe there are better GXM batteries, or whatever. Or, they're at or hydro or something. Yeah, like it's not, it's not a part of the solution but, space that I'd just categorically rule out. I think there's there's no reason why you do that. Um, where I it's more my problem is more that there seems to be a, a, a religious dedication to getting rid of hydrocarbons to. And building more wind turbines, like that, it, it seems almost like it's an article of of faith and a test of someone's moral purity if they if they believe in those things. Mm -hmm. um, and I I don't share that faith. I view these things as tools and potentially extremely mm -hmm. powerful tools. And I would by no means say no to a world that could be powered entirely by by wind and solar. Like I'm not, I'm not opposed to that. Like, if you generate reliable energy with acceptable downsides, because every energy, every form of energy generation has downsides. Like, yeah, fine. I don't give a shit. It, that sounds great. Um, if we come up with a way to mit to further mitigate the downsides of using hydrocarbons, and that's our form of energy generation, great. I, I'm actually not too fast. I just. I just want a good balance yeah. of, of positives and negatives in energy Should generation. Just be fairly practical. And it's but the uh, yeah <laughs> yeah the, but... the the issue is that like at least I see on the alternative energy front is a real um what would you say like they want to constrain the space of 
like they have a like their agenda is to shape the energy mm. s- systems to be a certain way to exclude fossil fuels and uh eventually um or massively reduce them and uh i think like having a heterogeneous uh energy supply is is good and actually probably, there's probably an argument to be made around like resilience around like having different technologies capable of like uh being mm. delivered in different circumstances like actually like diversity of um <clears throat> approaches is is like a really good thing for an energy grid to have to have multiple multiple ways to do it yeah i feel like there's almost no winning in this like it's like uh, like in tassie like we're apparently 100% renewable now because we've got hydro. So Tassie's got a bunch of hydro electric dams and um, they're really amazing. Then I talk to like an environmentalist person I'm like, yeah, but it destroys all the like blah, 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 blah. It's like, motherfucker, like, do you not understand? Like, okay, put in wind turbines. Then you're going to like have like all these issues, the fucking birds flying to wind turbines. And then you're going to have like, uh, let's put up solar panels. It's like, yeah, but now you've got to like use all this land that we could be using for something else or have a forest and it's going to be covered in these fucking ugly ass like solar panels it's like okay so we want to use like um i don't know like i don't know like ocean based like um uh energy generation and like tidal tidal energy generation like okay well that's going to fuck with the dolphins and the sharks and the seals and their their migra- migratory patterns or whatever it's just like yeah everything has trade-offs and everything will, will have some impact on the environment and um uh, you know, the only real solution that some of these people generally want is they just don't want people. <laughs> and they, they want, like, they want degrowth. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I was about to say that, that the solution to all of these things is for humans to to retreat. Yeah. Um, like, if, you, if you'll allow me to just be, like, a completely... Oh, not irrational, but just, a, like, it's just a borderline spiritual thought bubble. But... <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> the only place in the universe... So the universe is is cool and impressive, basically because it's really big. Like, that's its party trick. It's it's big. But in terms of complexity, like, you look at a, a star, it's not that interesting. Like, it's big and it's really hot is a star's trick. <laughs> um, and there's lots of them, so they're not very interesting. there's one place in the universe... Yeah, there's one place in the universe that we're aware of where, and it's, it's on Earth, where life appeared. And it, it's, it's this tiny speck where things are really weird. Now, most of space is just a vacuum. It's not even that, I don't know, there's wind or something. There's just fucking nothing. Whereas on Earth, you've got this tiny little speck where at first it was, it, it, it was just, it was, biological molecules that eventually uh, enclose themselves in some sort of phospholipid membrane. And it, it just keeps going up orders of complexity of these weird systems that use an entropic gradient, this, this inevitable decay that's all over the universe that takes that gradient, uses it to make increasingly more complex things. And eventually you get to animals which develop a sense of self-awareness. They're these points in the universe of the universal medium which is in this certain configuration that suddenly becomes aware of its own existence you've got this it's like (laughs) if you had if you have a body of water and you drag your hand through it and somewhere in that configuration of water in that whirlpool the water becomes aware of itself as a part of a whirlpool that's that's what's happening in the universe on Earth. That's what's happening with life, or with certain forms of life on Earth. It's this bizarre, spooky phenomenon that, as far as we know, is only happening here. And I want to see a universe full of life. I Yeah, that'd be so cool. I can't Put really justify this in terms other than an intuition that something very special has happened on earth Mm. is continuing to happen and i want that spread through the universe so far as we're aware the rest of the universe is dead yeah like it's just it's it's not even dead it's just inanimate like it would be it's it's just it's just there because dead is dead is a an animal or a a a biological concept it's just there and i don't want humans to reduce 
or throttle their energy usage because I no. the more energy we use, the better our ability to shape the universe around us and the better ability to spread, to spread yeah. life and consciousness so two, throughout a void. Two, two things on that. Like, and if that, you know, maybe that involves humans going into space, maybe that involves us creating non-biological life and shooting that into space. Uh, I'd be okay all with that too. I just want to start shooting a stuff in space. <laughs> universe. Do all of it. The thing, uh... and, and just you know, why would you throttle your ability to have a living universe for? Because they're short term. Like, they're okay. thinking in short term. Like whales and trees are, are cool, cool, but they're not going to fucking shoot AGI into space and see yeah. the universe with <laughs> life. Like. Human beings are deeply, deeply flawed, but we are the best shot, as far as we're aware, of a living universe. So, uh, and, uh, just why? Why would you? Why would you throttle that? So, two, two, two things. Like, just to put things in context. Like, most of the universe is intergalactic space. Most of the universe is intergalactic space, and mm. and I think if I remember correctly the vacuum of intergalactic space is more complete than any vacuum we've ever created here on earth. Like with, even with our best technology so far, <laughs> it's something like there's one height, there's an estimated one hydrogen atom per cubic meter in intergalactic space. So mm. most of, most of the universe, most of existence is just this vast empty space where the light traveling between the galaxies has a vanishingly small chance of even hitting a hydrogen atom on route between things. Like it's just like it's 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 astonishingly mm. empty. Like and 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 most of the stuff in the universe is like stars, as Jack said, and most and or or like large gas clouds. Uh, and mm. it's 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 just energy balls of energy just flowing into one another, creating like you know like quasars and stuff and just it's just energy just moving around it's not interesting like it's it's kind of interesting if you're a physicist and you want to study it but it's fairly like fairly uninteresting stuff and and then uh when you zoom in the second thing is like when you zoom into our planet which is the only planet that we know of that has life life is very special it's incredibly cool and um amazing and interesting and then there's been an estimated something like 10 billion species or 100 billion species maybe like there's 10 billion extant species of animals and plants uh and then like how many hundreds of billions of like um if you include protozoa and stuff and um over the course of like all of evolutionary history over the last like three three to four billion years like there's been an astonishingly like mind-bendingly huge number of species and within those species like unbelievable number of individual organisms okay of all of those organisms only like about 10 are known to have been able to do the thing that humans can do so like homo erectus homo floresiensis um like and so forth maybe australopithecus if that was like actually a homo species and it was like mislabeled and homo neanderthalus and obviously like homo sapiens and of those, like, say, like, call it 10 species uh, or known 10 species that had the capability to create knowledge of their minds and then, like, modify their environment around them, nine of them are dead. <laughs> nine of them fucking died. They didn't make mm. it. So clearly this, like, creativity thing doesn't guarantee you, like, a ticket out of um, out of the, the, the gravity well of the planet. Um, you know, they all died, whether it was us or just, be, you know, something else killed them. Like maybe, you know, the stasis of their own culture is probably what killed them. Probably wasn't homo sapiens. And, um, and, and there's been uh, so many times over the course of human civilization, uh, when, uh, humans have become, have come just like, just like so close to just dying, like game over, no more. You know, um, and yeah, yeah, like the and um, there seems like there have been points where there have been a few tens of thousands yeah, yeah. of humans, and Earth. and you know, once you drop below a certain number of individuals, like you actually the population can't recover from like there's not enough genetic diversity, and it's just like a, you're in a sink basically. Um, luckily, we didn't dip below that, so 
this is extremely special and humans are extremely special. Hey, you, listener, you, yeah, listener, watcher, you're very special. You're extremely special. You are a creative problem solver and you have the capacity to change the universe in a way that no other known entity in the entire observable universe is able to do. And that is extremely special. That's extremely special. You are worth being alive. Ignore the environmentalists, ignore all the other naysayers. You should not have been aborted. <laughs> it's good to be alive. It's also good to be like with other people. And the more people that we have, the better. Now, the issue is, Jack, here that like I think that people like don't have an appreciation of how special how special this is. Like it's it's like maybe it takes some studying of history, human civilization, maybe it takes some like studying of like biology or like cosmology or something, but it doesn't take that much study to just realize like, oh, actually what's going on is extremely special. And the fact that there's people who are disparaging of it and actively trying to stop it and are proposing interventions that would potentially like bring human civilization to uh, its knees <laughs> if, if they actually worked, I think it's just like so profoundly misguided. I'm not, I wouldn't even say that they're bad people or anything. I just feel like they're, yeah, so like misguided. It's like, there's, there's some things missing in like uh, the perspective that I think should be included that they haven't included. Yeah, and I think so, some of the misanthropy is motivated by things that I I have a lot of empathy for. So you know, there, there's this space, spaceship Earth idea that we we need the Earth, and like I, I totally agree for the next for the foreseeable future with our current technology, we need the Earth. Like, we're totally fucked without it. We shouldn't trash our home. Like, I'm all for not annihilating our planet. It's, it's back to talking about, say, with energy generation, the, the trade-offs of it. So one of those trade-offs is you need, you need to preserve the place where you live. Like we, we need Earth, especially at the moment. And even if we develop the ability to leave the planet and live elsewhere, why wouldn't we want to preserve our home where we're from? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like I'm in total agreement with that stuff, I just don't think the solution or the, the way to preserve the planet, to preserve the diversity of life on it is to just shut down human creativity. Yeah, no, no, definitely not. And to shut down human energy generation. Um, all of the exciting stuff happening on Earth is ultimately because we... So with, we're the same stuff. Like we're not fundamentally physic in a physical sense, physics sense different from the rest of the universe. We're a different configuration of the underlying medium of the universe. We're just a very interesting configuration. And we're doing something special. That's we become cool. things on Earth become more and more interesting. Basically, the more capably they utilize these entropy gradients. And the utilization of an entropy gradient is you can also call it energy generation. We We've reached the point where we can move around entro those entropy gradients, so move around in space and put them in places where they're more useful for us. And I don't think it's accidental that where things are most interesting is basically where that gradient is being used more. And hence why I think the, the more energy we produce, the cooler things get, the more interesting the universe locally becomes and eventually hopefully we can do it so effectively we can just we'd spread it through the universe we can yeah how cool that this strange phenomenon of life on earth could be driven so much further and i, I just don't think it should be yeah. limited and i think like there's all the you know all the big problems that get you know yeah you know, as people who have listened to the show might know i like diving and uh scuba diving and free diving uh and uh snorkeling and stuff and you know so uh i'm concerned about a lot of the uh issues in in the ocean like ocean plastics the destruction of like coral reefs down in tasmania the destruction of like the kelp forests and the sponge gardens and stuff you know so the, there's there's two levels of analysis on that like at the end of the day you know humans are not the environment's always changing ecosystems always you know changing species are going extinct all the time over long enough time horizon things change and you know new species emerge and adapt and so forth so somewhat dispassionate it's just like yep that's 
what happens even if humans weren't here like there's no such thing as this like pristine globe that just like does stay static and all the like fucking fish and coral and mm. stuff just like magically get along like kumbaya in the fucking like ocean and just like nothing ever changes that that's just that's just that you know some anybody who has that kind of image of nature just does, like they've just never actually like thought about <laughs> like about the world like mm. what was it's the difference is we speed things yeah or we humans or, are just this catalyst for change or, we just accelerate or we cause changes to occur that might not have otherwise occurred um if it were you know for mm. example like um you know like example of like fucking ridiculous practices in like indonesia and thailand and stuff i it still happens occasionally, but they're doing it less. They do this uh, thing, like dynamite, dynamite, dynamite fishing. Yeah, they're just like, and they just fucking destroy it. Like corals, like decades <laughs> old, just destroy it. And just to catch some fish like once, you know, it's a completely ridiculous thing to do. Um, and it's horrible when, when you when you see that stuff or you see the consequences of that stuff. Um, so that's one level of analysis. Like, okay, well, things change. So, you know, it is what it is you know not necessarily a very useful level of analysis but the, the other level of analysis is like <clears throat> well yeah those problems exist but problems are sol soluble and just because you know like the ocean plastic one is like there's a giant patch of garbage in in the middle of the uh pacific ocean and there's heaps of garbage if you go into like indonesia or thailand or whatever you see it's just, it's crazy it's crazy it's like it's crazy um and uh but you should also know that like back in the 70s and stuff like sydney harbor like you couldn't swim in sydney harbor i still probably wouldn't but like it used to be fucking disgusting and <laughs> australia's gotten better at our waste management there's still a long way to go except what you have to do is like look at uh like um the environmental indicators from like uh like the the eighties and nineties and stuff. It's getting better. And we can keep on getting better. And people there's also people working on getting the ocean plastic out of the Pacific Ocean. Like you can go and look it up. Like there's giant trawling uh the companies that set up these trawlers that collect the plastic then try to like turn the plastic back into like forms that they can mm. take send back to the land and then reuse and reuse it. So it's like these there's people working on these problems. And um, to throw up your hand and just say like, no, it's all fucked. We need what we need really is just like to shut everything down, to constrain mm. creativity, to tell people that they can't raise their standards of living, to, and so forth. Um, I think it's just like it's 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 a it's lazy thinking at the very least, and it's destructive and it's um, and it's anti-human and it's uncreative. It's like okay, why can't we have um both uh, accelerating technological growth and wealth for everybody and also a beautiful, thriving environment that we enjoy and that we love and that's that's beautiful. That seems to me like a world that would be good to strive towards and there's people working to make the world that way so that we can have both all the things that we need coming out of like industrialization and stuff and we can also in the future like have, um, you know, coral reefs restored and thriving and so forth. Like I think all of those things are possible and anybody who tells you that it's not possible I think has... A political agenda to beat you over the head with problems are solvable don't let anybody else don't let anybody tell you that some problem is not soluble it is mm. well it's human history is just this series of of impossible problems being solved yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's so for it's like it's like the wright brothers who just, just repeatedly told it is impossible for humans to fly in a sustained manner to fucking bicycle manufacturers who ignored that advice, and I think it was with nineteen oh three or something. Yeah. Their first flight. It was like Lord Kelvin in like eighteen ninety said something to the effect of like faster than horse uh, manned air travel is impossible. It's forbidden by the laws of physics, and he was wrong. Mm. That's Lord Kelvin of yeah. the Kelvin and scale. Now you, <laughs> now it's like the the limits on how quickly we travel through the air. Uh, are based on sonic booms. They're based on how loud it is for people on the ground. It's not actually a technical problem. We can send things through the air really fast with yeah, humans in, fact, in them. It's just it's a trade off. We decided it's actually it's really unpleasant to live below flat paths of supersonic aircraft, and so we we the limit slow how down of uh, air travel. travel is largely political and social, not technological. <laughs> And not, not um, like, again, it's, a <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. nice to live under supersonic uh, ever, but it's actually, it, it shows that our problem-solving capability is is huge and it's it's 
basically continuous. Like I said, we continuously solve apparently impossible problems. It, it magically keeps happening. And magically, at the time a given speaker is living, that's always the point at which problems are now impossible. Like in 1968, right before the world's population <laughs> doubled and then also at the same time rates of poverty collapsed <laughs> and yet he still doesn't admit yeah, that he was yeah, wrong yeah. that's it's just the, the height of dis, like intellectual dishonesty is just ridiculous that's crazy how much more do you have to say about this because i feel like anything i say will be a, a repetition of this much more to say you can solve problems i think the future is actually going to be the future is going to be difficult and unpredictable but i think it's going to be good um, i think people should feel and would you want, would you want the future to be predictable? Our ability to solve problems, to make more problems yeah. with those solutions. I don't think it's like, say, say the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski said that we've, we've solved meaningful problems. Now everything's a surrogate activity and we need to go back mm. to a time. We need to, to remove our technology so we have access to meaningful mm. problems again. I think that's bullshit. I think every solution to, problem, to a meaningful problem creates more meaningful problems and you solve those. Um, there's something that I can only intuit, I can't prove to you, about the existence of life as being deeply special in a universal sense that we've got to that we should push further. <laughs> um, like there's there's just a lot in the world that's really great and good and makes me happy to be alive. And people like Paul Ehrlich exist to try to convince people otherwise for some perverse reason. Yeah. <laughs> and I just it, it's just the, the it's really bizarre great. isn't it yeah <laughs> just stop being such a fucking debbie yeah downer it'd be understandable it. if you're like 16 it's I know, great like when you're 16 and, or whatever it's like like everything is pretty doom and gloom but like once you grow out of that stuff but early never grow out of it <laughs> yeah you know, like damn yeah <laughs> and people you know there are plenty of people in the world in terrible situations but again that's that's another set of yeah, problems help that can be solved. <laughs> yeah. it's not <laughs> That's what you care about. It's not about. the mutable law of physics that, yeah. There's there's so many. So, I guess would we? So many issues with this whole point of view. But yeah. Yeah, I guess it's ultimately a very limited point of view, and the limitations are, are self-imposed. Yeah, that's a good point. It's self-imposed. It's like if you, someone. It's like, like if someone yeah. cut their own legs off and said it's impossible to run the hundred meters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> in in under fifteen <laughs> seconds, or just, something that's actually not and you'd that be like, hard. Have a, ha, let me it's, introduce I mean, you yes, to my good you, friend. If you impose all of these restrictions on yourself, then the future <laughs> won't be great. But if if you let it, the future's really cool. I, I think things are going to get why do, weirder I just can't understand why people are so pessimistic about the world. It's just like... Well, I, I think there are some reasons, and I think they're limited to, say, why great art or art that res resonates the most tends to be sad. I think it's just... It's probably in large part a a feature of the fact that we are biological organisms who can die. We tend to index... Or assign a greater salience to things that have mm. downside to things that have upside. So you, the, the the risk of death, say, like that that's the end that stops things for a, a biological system. So you you assign salience to things that can cause that sa state very highly. You give that a lot of salience. Things that things that have upside, you assign salience to as well, of course, but less than something that prevents you from doing anything else ever again. I think a lot of it, a, a lot of our fascination with terrible things happening is probably based on that, is based on how how death is a pretty clear fail state that we want to avoid. I think uh, you, you should, um, how do I put this? Not They're not exactly values, but um, what's the, what's the hue? Of, of the life that you're going to live. Uh, you, you could be like uh, fear or hatred or whatever, in pretty dark hues. And, or you could have like curiosity <laughs> and excitement and enthusiasm and wonder and also have your eyes wide open to like the difficulties of life and, and the world. Uh, uh, I don't know. 
I think like there's definitely the one that I know that I'm picking. So I think I'd everybody who's listening right now, just like remember mm. that uh, the uh, the future is open. Uh, you have the power and the agency to positively affect it. Uh, and yeah, always maintain that. Uh, remember that like problems are solvable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In terms of recommending this book, I wouldn't recommend this book. Um, I would recommend actually reading something yeah, by Malthus. Malthus. original stuff. Not because he's necessarily correct, important. but because it's historically important and there is, it, it's, it's never ending. There, there are constantly books mm. being released which eff- effectively rephrase mm. what Malthus mm. said, but less succinctly. Mm. Mm. And I feel like if you just read things by Malthus then you're going to have effectively read a better version of all of the things mm. that came after him and didn't learn from his mm. mistakes. Mm. So I wouldn't recommend this. I would recommend becoming at least somewhat acquainted with Malthus. Mm. And if you've done that, you don't really need to read more mm. books in in the same vein afterwards. Yeah. Um, and if you're on that crazy train, like I don't, I don't know if we have many environmentally oriented people, but if... If you are in that, uh, like reading heavily in that field, just remember that, like, if you just like whether it's Naomi Klein or any of the others, just like draw, like write at the beginning of the book your own preface that says, on the assumption that people choose not to solve any of the problems highlighted in this book. <laughs> just put that caveat in there. For mm. them. <laughs> but also the, the books tacitly acknowledge that you can solve problems because if you truly didn't think that humans had any agency, you wouldn't write a book to try to convince yeah. them, presumably of some sort of course of action to rectify the problems you're yeah. pointing out in the book. So that there's a tacit acknowledgement of it. It's just an acknowledgement. I think the, that tacit acknowledgement only extends problem-solving capabilities in a limited way. And also to say it's a problem of envi- you know, people who care about the environment. It's The environment's really important. I, like I, will, I will definitely not discount the importance of the environment. I think it's more... It's, it's a particular religious dedication to only a very small portion of the solution space in response to environmental problems that I have a problem they, with. Yes, they have an extremely strong skew to the... Yeah. Hmm. Um, yeah, just keep that in mind. Um, but, yeah. uh, what's um, next on our reading list? Do we have another, anything else? I can't remember. I just want, actually, shout out to the new people nice. on Patreon, to, a uh, Yerpel, Nick, Donnie, and Ben. <laughs> Big shout out to those people. Uh, if you have, if you've got names on Discord that I'm not aware of, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> shout out to your, your preferred Discord name as well. I'll be back in the, uh, in the session, yeah, in the Discord people. session soon when I stop being sick. I mean, like pretty unwell recently. So, get back in there. Hopefully next week. Yeah, the, the oh, things have been well, a, bit, this, a bit busier than usual. Well, recently. this will be published after I come come back into the um, Patreon group. But yeah, um, things in the past had been more more busy than <laughs> usual. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. Is there anything else to say? Next books, we'll be doing some exciting things. We're going to be having more people on the podcast. Which I'm looking forward yeah, to. Yeah, we've got some. I'm um, looking forward to we'll um, be, uh, yeah. Justin Murphy. That'll be cool. He's really interesting. If we get to. Yeah. 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 Hopefully, hopefully that comes yeah, together. Yeah. We've got. We're, we're chatting to some really cool people that I, I'd really love to have on the show. So hopefully that all works out. Um, Want to do more interviews? Yeah. The, fu- the future's bright. Most importantly, the future of the book club from hell is bright. <laughs> That that trumps every other consideration. <laughs> this is this is what all life in the universe is pointing towards. <laughs> all history of the universe has led up to this point <laughs> when the book club from hell could exist. This is the zenith of existence. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Oh yeah. No, the, the zenith of existence is as this gets Leave larger. It. The larger it gets. Uh, <laughs> to have like the higher the a fucking strong coffee and a, and like a sleep before getting on this episode. So I can like drag, drag myself into. Like, <laughs> I just want to go back to sleep now, so I'm going to um uh, say yes. The future of this book club looks a lot brighter when 
uh, one or both of us are back to back to fighting health. <laughs> yeah, we're not both of us are sick, <laughs> but we're committed. We're committed. <laughs> we're committed to solving problems of talking about Paul Ehrlich to a group of internet weirdos. That's our that's our problem space and our solution. I don't know uh, how so big uh, Jack 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 clocks the um, the analytics numbers. I don't look at them because. I don't know, it just seems like a, a game that I don't want to play. Just looking at the analytics numbers. Um, but um, by the sounds of it, we're, we're slowly growing, which is good. Um, shout out Jack for being on top of, on top of that. Um, uh, I'm going to institute a, a deep growth strategy <laughs> for the podcast. <laughs> um, I think that's a good to, idea. To the extent that like, hopefully we're having a, a positive impact on our listeners. Um, yeah, that that that's really good whether it's uh like one person or hopefully lots more than than one (laughs) but uh uh i hope i hope that we're we're having a positive impact um on you whoever you are out there in the world listening and uh yeah keep on tuning in yeah thanks for listening (laughs) see you next time what do we what do we got next i think don delora See you next time. time. Thanks 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 for listening.